Uh oh. Just kidding. Had to do that. All right. I'm the reason why we're late here, so I apologize. Um, good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Vancouver City Council meeting for Tuesday, February the 14th, uh, 2023. Uh, happy Valentine's Day, everyone. Can you guys hear me? Yeah? Okay, good. Uh, this council meeting is being convened by electronic means as authorized under Part 14 of the Procedure Bylaw, the City of Vancouver Electronic Meetings. As such, council members and the public may participate in person or by electronic means. If a council member attending by electronic means loses connection during the voting process, team members are available to get you back online quickly while the voting process is suspended. Uh, the team member's contact information has been circulated to you. A video of council members speaking, presentations, and uh, vote results will be projected on the live stream when available. Council members are reminded that, in accordance with Section 14.13 of the Procedure Bylaw, members must enable their video to confirm quorum. Uh, in case of an emergency where you need to, where we need to evacuate the building, I would like to uh, direct your attention to the exits. There are two exits beyond the glass doors. There you go. Kind of like a, an airport or an airplane. Um, and uh, to the left, if the glass, so uh, basically you, you go through the glass doors and then you, you hang a left past the post. If the glass doors are obstructed, please direct your attention to the four exits in this chamber. So the four doors here. And please use the stairs. Uh, do not use the elevator. And be incredibly calm. We will all make it out. Uh, Knock on wood. Uh, I I would also like to highlight that if there uh, that there is a defibrillator uh, located at the end of the hallway outside of the count, uh, council chamber, so to the very uh, back of the room there. Uh, I'd also like to acknowledge that we are hosting today's uh, council uh, uh, session on the unceded territories of the Squamish, Musqueam, and Tsleil-Waututh First Nations, and I do want to thank them uh, for their generosity and their hospitality and the love and the care that they share or they show our land. Um, and uh, you know, I I would like to remind people. Um, or highlight the fact that, uh, you know, there are a lot of things that we need to unlearn and relearn. And I would encourage you to, you know, jump on that uh, journey. Now, today, it's a little somber. It does mark the 32nd Annual Women's Memorial March. Uh, community will gather on the downtown east side to march together, uh, stopping at locations where missing women were last seen or found. Uh, City Hall is flying a combination of Indigenous flags at 12th and Canby, including the missing and murdered Indigenous women, uh, women and girls flag for the week of February uh, 13th through 20th, or sorry, 13th through 17th to honour this occasion. And once again, I do want to highlight, um, you know, it, the individuals that went missing, we have to, you know, hopefully remember that everyone was someone's sister or daughter. Um, or friend, um, we're talking about a very at-risk, um, vulnerable population. And let's not forget that we still have a lot of work to do um, to, um, you know, um, to protect uh, people who need it. I also want to take a moment to recognize the immense contributions of our uh, city team here. And uh, they work incredibly hard and super proud um, and just in awe of everything that our team does. And uh, I, I feel very fortunate that we get to work side by side uh, with each other. Okay, clerk, may we please have a roll call? Mayor Sim is in the chair, Councilor Carr. Councilor Cobia? Not in the chamber, Councilor Dominado. Councilor Bly? Present. Councilor Boyle? Present. Councilor Fry? Present. Councilor Montague? Present. Councilor Klassen? Present. Councilor Meisner? Present. And Councilor Joe? Present. You have Corn Mayerson. Great, thank you very much. Okay, uh, any comments on agenda items can be sent to Council using the web form on the City's website. The link to that form will be tweeted out at, or sorry, on at Van City Clerk. I also want to note the City of Vancouver's long-standing commitment to equity, diversity, and inclusion, including the utmost respect for all genders. I remind Council that when addressing speakers and the City's team members, we will avoid using gen uh, gendered honorifics and will instead refer to the person by first and last name, role, or title. So today we have three administrative items, in-camera motion, adoption of minutes, and matters adopted on consent. 
one presentation, one communication, eight reports, and six referral reports, four bylaws, four council member motions, notice of council members' motions, and new business inquiries and other matters. The plan for today, uh, we will break at noon for lunch, followed by an in-camera meeting. We will return here at 3 p.m., continue to deal with the remainder of the agenda, and finish by 5 p.m. as there is a public hearing at 6 p.m. tonight. Now, uh, Council is requ required to meet in camera later this week. The reasons and the authority under the Vancouver Charter are listed in the agenda. Would someone like to move a motion to go in camera later this week? Uh, Councillor Klassen, seconded by Councillor Carr. Thank you. Um, all those in favour say yay. All those opposed say nay. Great. The motion carries unanimously. Uh, minutes one are from the Council uh, meeting of January the 31st, 2023. Are there any corrections to the minutes? Would someone like to move adoption? Uh, so, uh, Councillor Carr uh, moved it, uh, seconded by Councillor Meisner. Great. All those in favor say yay. Great. All those opposed say nay. The motion carries unanimously. Minutes two are from the council meeting following the standing committee of fi uh, city finance and services meeting of February the 1st, 2023. Are there any corrections to the minutes? Would someone like to move adoption? Councillor Joe, thank you. Seconded. Uh, Councillor Montague, thank you. Uh, all those in favour say yay. All those opposed say nay. Great. The motion carries unanimously. Minutes three are from the Auditor General Committee meeting of February the 2nd, 2023. Are there any corrections to the minutes? Uh, would someone like to move adoption? Great. Um, <clears throat> Councillor Montague, may we have a seconder? Great, Councillor Dominato, um, all those in favour say yay. All those opposed say nay. Uh, the motion carries unanimously. Uh, minutes four are from the Court of Revision BIA meeting on February the 2nd, 2023. Are there any corrections to the minutes? Uh, would someone like to move adoption? Councillor Carr, thank you. Uh, may we have a seconder? Councillor Joe, thank you very much. All those in favour say yay. All those opposed say nay. The motion carries unanimously. Okay, uh, matters adopted on consent. Well, we're just ripping through this. This is great. Uh, council will now consider. Uh, hopefully, I didn't jinx that. Councilor, uh, council will now consider matters adopted on consent. We have uh, communication one, report uh, two through eight, and referral reports one through six, uh, six on the consent agenda for council's consideration. Council may adopt the recommendations for communication one, reports two through eight, and referral reports one through six on consent. Should I say one? It, it should be, um, no, reports two through eight. It, it was communication one. So I'll, I'll, uh, I'll uh, say it again. Council may adopt the recommendations for communication one, reports two through eight, and referral reports one through six on consent. I probably misspoke. Thank you. Um, ooh, Councillor Meisner, does any member wish to hold any of these items for debate or questions to team members? And we have Councillor Meisner. Yeah, I have some questions around report five. So if we could hold that, please. Okay. So, report five. Um, anyone else? Great. Uh, does any member wish to declare a conflict of interest on the consent item? Okay. All right. Just bear with me for one sec. There are a lot of reports here. Okay, so. Okay, so we have the following. We have uh, communication one changes to the 2023 council meeting schedule. We have report um, number two, uh, 2023 street cl uh, cleaning grants. We have report number three, appointment of child care operators, lease approvals, child care grant approvals, and approval of funding for maintenance of licensed child care centers at West Fraser Lands. 
uh, Henry Hudson Elementary School and Marpole Community Centre. We have report number four, funding application to the use, uh, UBCM Community Emergency Preparedness Fund for Emergency Support Services. We have report number six, alignment with the electrical safety regulations, housekeeping and miscellaneous updates to the building and electrical bylaws. We have report number seven, establishment of civic agencies. And report number eight, Auditor General Committee recommendations transmitter report. And we have referral reports one uh, through six. So number one is rezoning 5828 to 5850 Granville Street. Number two, rezoning 1522 West 45th Avenue and 6137 Granville Street. Uh, report number three, CD-1 rezoning 7688 to 7720 Canby Street. Referral report four, CD-1 rezoning 103 to 111 North Templeton Drive and uh, 2185 Oxford Street. Referral report number six, rezoning 817 to 837 West 28th Avenue and 4375 Willow Street. And referral report number six, miscellaneous amendments concerning various CD-1 bylaws. Um, would someone like to move adoption of so the moved. recommendation? Second. Thank you very So it was moved by Councillor Carr or no, Councillor Dominato, and then seconded by Councillor Carr. All those in favor say yay. All those opposed say nay. Great, the motion carries unanimously. All right, so now I have to read that out again. Uh, the following has been approved on, uh, it's okay? I read it? Yes, great. Saved about 19 minutes there. Um, at this time, I would like to recommend we uh, move a motion to vary the agenda in order to hear the uh, report one before the presentation. Would someone like to move a motion? Thank you very much, Councillor Carr. Is there a seconder? Councillor Meisner, uh, the motion carries. Okay, our first item is report one, grant to VCH for expanded mental health response. Does any member wish to declare a conflict of interest on this item? I miss it. Oh, thank you. Sorry. Uh, the mo so the motion has not carried yet. Has the motion carried or? As for. Okay. Um, is there uh, any discussion on um, uh, the motion? No? All right, so um, all in favor. This is the motion to move the uh, report up um, in front of the presentation. I know, a little, little tricky, isn't it? Okay, uh, so uh, is there any discussion on moving up? No, great, uh, so we'll bring it to a vote now. All in favor of moving the uh, uh, report one before the pr presentation say yay. Yeah, great, all those opposed say nay. Great, the motion carries. All right, our first item is report number one, grant to VCH for expanded mental health response. Does any member wish to declare uh, a conflict of interest on this item? Great. Uh, we now have uh, Sandra Singh, General Manager, Arts, Culture and Community Services here to uh, provide opening remarks. Sandra. Um, good morning, Mayor and Council. We are delighted to be here with you this morning to report back to you on the motion that um, that Council passed in November 2022 as one of your first orders of business. Um, so I'm here today with uh, Mary Claire Zach, our Managing Director of Social Policy and Projects um, and Partners um, VCH and VPD. We have with us Dr. Patricia Daly, uh, Bob Chapman, Vice President of Vancouver uh, Community, their colleagues who they will introduce later on, as well as Deputy Chief Fiona Wilson from VPD, should you have any questions around VPD. So, um, as, uh, as Council will recall, you passed quite an extensive motion in November related to enhancing mental health supports in the city. This report back today uh, relates simply to items C and F, and we will report back on other matters uh, in that motion at a future date. So this is related to the grant to VCH to enable them to increase their, their service, mental health services in community, in particular uh, to people in crisis, as well as 
as related to the evaluation of the of any programming that arises from the city's investment. So um, I will uh, turn the presentation over to Dr. Daly and Mr. Chapman to walk you through the uh, the mental health response framework that VCH. Uh, in, uh, created in response to Council's motion and interest in funding this work. And at the end of the presentation, I have a couple of administrative matters around how we will process the grant. And then as mentioned, we have the whole team here to uh, support your deliberations by answering any questions that you may have. I will turn it over to BCH colleagues. Thank you, Sandra, and, and good morning to everyone. Good morning, Mayor and Council. I'm Patricia Daly. I'm the Chief Medical Health Officer and Vice President of Public Health with Vancouver Coastal Health, and I'll be presenting with Bob Chapman, as you heard. I'd also like to introduce our colleagues who are real experts in some of the programs we're going to be talking about, Dr. J.J. Sadu, who's one of our psychiatrists here in Vancouver community, Caitlin Etherington and Bonnie Wilson, who have done tremendous work putting together this proposal today. Now, I'm just going to start by once again acknowledging that we are uh, presenting today on the traditional unceded territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh Nations. And Vancouver Coastal Health Geography actually covers uh, the geography of 14 additional, 14 total First Nations in BC. Uh, in addition, if we look at the Indigenous population within Vancouver Coastal Health, most of them actually live within the urban core. Uh, they come not only from the 14 First Nations shown here, but from First Nations and Métis and Inuit communities from across BC and elsewhere in Canada. We also know that Indigenous people in this province uh, don't enjoy the same health status as the rest of the population. There are preventable inequities in their health status that we aim to narrow. And uh, just want to acknowledge, as the mayor did, that this week we also have the march acknowledging the missing and murdered Indigenous women and uh, Indigenous women and Indigenous men in particular today, as we talk about mental, mental health and substance use issues, are overrepresented among some of those that we aim to serve by the proposals that we're putting forward today. And you will see among those proposals um, are funding for additional support to uh, focus on addressing uh, the Indigenous population within the urban core. Now, I'm going to start by just reminding uh, Mayor and Council of the uh, the City of Vancouver Healthy City Strategy. And the reason I do this is because as, um, uh, as Council passed this motion and as Vancouver Coastal Health have put together this proposal, there's been some question about why the City of Vancouver would fund a health strategy. And I remind, as I've done for many years working as the medical health officer here in the, as, for the City of Vancouver, uh, if we look at the things that determine good health in our population, health services are one of the determinants of health, but they probably account for only 25% of our, of our overall population health. 75% is determined by other things, things like uh, education, housing, uh, poverty, uh, early childhood development. And in fact, municipal governments can play a critical role in improving the health of the populations they serve by addressing some of these underlying determinants of health. And that's what the Vancouver Healthy City Strategy aims to do. Uh, in fact, under BC's Public Health Act, as medical health officer, I'm required to, to work with all municipalities in, in our region to develop healthy city strategies. And I would say that the City of Vancouver Healthy City Strategy is the most robust of any municipality, not only in our region, but maybe across Canada. So in thinking about this, it makes sense that Mayor and Council would be concerned about uh, uh, an important health issue, the mental health and substance use challenges, of the inner city population in Vancouver and aim to address those through, um, in this case, a grant. And I'm now going to invite my colleague, Bob Chapman, up to describe to you the details of the proposal we have for you today. Uh, thank you so much. Um, I, uh, I also want to acknowledge that uh, Fiona Wilson is with us here today from the VPD, and uh, I'd like to start by just thanking uh, the city staff and the partners at VPD, uh, as well as all of our team, some of whom are here today, who put work into this framework and model uh, to move us forward. So thank you to everyone for everything you've put in to make this uh, where we are today. Um, we thought we'd start with just a, a, a bit of a goal from our perspective about how we want to move forward with this great opportunity for these resources. 
um, that will actually uh, provide some much needed services in Vancouver. And really it's about trying to start with the right foot forward, a culturally safe health forward system for our response to people in crisis. Um, we really do want to look at a therapeutic way to support people in their mental health crisis. And secondarily, we also want to ensure that we support people to de-escalate uh, in or near a crisis uh, with a health lens. Um, and thirdly, we really want, as Patty's mentioned um, and others have referenced, uh, to have uh, an Indigenous perspective around not just the care that people receive, but the lens we provide around how we change outcomes for those that we care for in Vancouver who have an Indigenous background, and as Patty mentioned, are overrepresented in many of the programs that we see. So the framework uh, is uh, six components. Uh, for this fiscal year, we're really talking about the response part at the top of the framework. Uh, our intention is to look at the secondary piece, the proactive part in subsequent years. Um, really, we're looking at expanding our police partnership, what we refer to as our CAR 8788 programs. We're looking at a non-police de-escalation program. We do not have that in Vancouver at this time. And we're looking, at, as, as I mentioned, to strengthen our Indigenous approaches across all of our mental health and substance use services, and in particular, those from a crisis response perspective. We will, in future years, we won't talk about this much today, look at a more proactive way to outreach to individuals who we know are starting to decompensate. Uh, we will also look at a more wraparound team model for some individuals that are really struggling in their journey and recovery. And we will also look at transitions and flow for people to be better integrated back into the community. So this slide really takes those six components and gives you a bit more information about it. And really what I'd like to say around the police partnership programs and the expansion of the car is we know that we only uh, are able to respond to the calls with the police, a CAR-A7, car D 8 which is a nurse and a police officer together in a small portion of the asks that we receive, maybe about 30, 35% of the time. This will actually double the number of cars on the road for us with nurses in them. And I just also want to reiterate that in the car D 7 car D 8 program, the nurse is first in the response. The police are there as backup to support us in situations where we think staff are going to be at risk or we actually need to implement components and pieces around the Mental Health Act and bring people to hospital. We do require the police for those components. Our moderate de-escalation is the bulk of the resources that we're putting forward for uh, this initiative in the next fiscal year. And it really is about uh, supporting a non-police response for people who have a moderate escalation that we can divert to uh, nurses, social workers, community liaison workers, and peers as a bulk of the team. You will see that we are approaching uh, these initiatives with uh, a very diverse team. It is reflective of what we do in health around all of our mental health and substance use and addiction services. Um, I think nurses are a critical component of that, but they are not the only team members that can add value to someone's experience in their recovery. And the third piece of this is really looking at embedding some Indigenous uh, supports and educators to help us around our response and also help with some very Indigenous-specific care for people in the model. We sometimes get asked about the level of escalation around risk for individuals, and we thought this might be helpful to set the frame of how our responses are here. So, so often we have uh, at the most uh, urgent of a situation an M11 call for someone to get help. We definitely try wherever we can to have the health nurse and police officer and CAR 7 to respond next. We have a few other teams that also are uh, clinicians, social workers, and nurses with uh, police in attendance, uh, our uh, serve outreach team, and our what we call ACT, our serve community treatment team. And then we're building in, in the black uh, the moderate non-police de-escalation service, which is not something, as I mentioned, we have right now, which is really trying to look at individuals that we can see who are starting to uh, decompensate and escalate. And we are trying to get preventative and not have them get to a major crisis. We have been in contact with the Canadian Mental Health Association. We are aware of the PAC model, and we do see this as a piece of the continuum. Um, our approach around the moderate uh, de-escalation is really a health response so that we can ensure it's embedded with our health services. But we are certainly um, 
uh, in conversation and, and open to partnering around pack minerals as well. So as I mentioned in the first phase, our initial investment is really going to be in those three response areas, the priorities within our framework. Um, we are also committing to a community reference group to really help us guide the de-escalation response. I'm, I'm not sure why it's turning off, so I'm not sure if I'm doing something wrong. Um, and it really is looking at uh, proof of concept to make sure that this is actually meeting the need, and uh, which leads me to the third piece of this. We are committing to an external evaluation to help us uh, understand the impact of these services. And before we actually invest in further phases, are we uh, on the right track? So as I mentioned in phase two, we will look at a more proactive pieces of our framework and uh, absolutely take that uh, reference group and evaluation components into play. We do expect over the coming year um, that it will take us uh, some time to hire up all these teams. And so uh, I'm not entirely sure when the evaluation can realistically start, but we'll definitely um, uh, start that as soon as we're able to. This gives you a bit of an indication of some of the positions that we're putting in place uh, and the different uh, teams they will be uh, involved in. And um, I won't go into too much detail, but it just gives you a sense of uh, how we're going to increase some of our response and contact. And uh, there have been some questions to us about how we are going to triage and manage the responses. There are multiple ways to access our services. There are three core areas up there that you can actually uh, call and refer to us. We expect those to continue. We will coordinate across those uh, ways to reach us, and we will then try and determine uh, with a, a better triage approach how we actually respond. Is it a car response? Is it a patrol response? Is it the moderate de-escalation de team, the non-police response? This is roughly our timeline that we expect over the coming uh, year uh, to really start to hire up, uh, do postings, and uh, bring people online. Uh, this may change depending on uh, how successful we are, but we're pretty confident. We have had uh, a number of new investments in many services in the inner city, and we have, although it's timely, it takes some time, we have been successful to recruit into these positions. This is the budget that we're putting forward that will relate to this. You can see how we will scale up over the first year uh, and actually get to our full implementation in year two, uh, which of course then would also have the additional uh, phase two components that we would bring on. And there are just a couple things that we need to sort out around logistics. Uh, we actually haven't sorted out where all the staff are going to sit, where they're going to be yet. We do know that that's something we have to work on. And I do think that there is an important piece missing in our system that we will be working with our nonprofits and our city partners around. Um, when you have someone who is escalating and needing a response, keeping them on the street corner to try and de-escalate them is actually not an ideal place. We need some safe, welcoming drop-in spaces where we can take people in a quiet, lower stimulation environment where they can be supported and we can work, continue to work with them and determine where we're going to go from there with our other teams and other services. Some of these individuals are likely to have been known to us or some of our teams, some of them may not, and that's some of the work that we'll have to do. So there is some work to come, ahead, to come forward for us around how we uh, actually uh, determine and identify some of those spaces. And that's you. Thank you so much. Okay, just a, uh, a few administrative matters, and then we'll, uh, we'll be available for questions. This is the largest operating grant that ACCS has, um, has brought to Council for consideration. Um, and given the complexity of, of expanding the existing services and starting up the new services that Bob described, um, we're, uh, what we're recommending is uh, up to the $2.8 million to support the, the initiation of phase one in 2023 as per VCH's proposal, and then scaling up um, to uh, uh, in further years based on implementation. Um, as you'll see in the report, 
Um, there are a number of, uh, of things that can impact implementation of a program, hiring, delays, things like that. And so we just want to make sure as we, um, as we, as we provide this funding this, uh, to, to VCH that, uh, um, that we're doing in a way that uh, is, is aligned with uh, their, their ramping these services up. So the grant agreement uh, will seek to release the funding on a quarterly basis after reporting uh, to, to tie that funding to the, to the actual spends will be very closely, we work very closely with uh, VCH as Dr. Daly noted and Bob noted now, um, and we'll continue to do that as we, as we support them in the, in the uh, rollout of this program. And uh, we're very uh, excited by the evaluation um, ideas that VCH, the VCH team has put forward in their proposal, and they've confirmed that their methodology will include, uh, you know, metrics and qualitative analysis, Indigenous methodology, with a and with a particular focus as well on how these services support Indigenous, Black, people of color, women marginalized, differently abled, and LGBTQIA2S plus people. So it's quite an extensive uh, evaluation um, that, uh, um, that we anticipate that will demonstrate the impact that these services will have in community. So that is uh, uh, the end of our presentation, and we are pleased to answer any questions that you may have. Uh, Council, you have up to five minutes to ask questions of team members. Um, and before, uh, there's a whole, whole queue, queue here. I just want to remind everyone, uh, he gave me grief for uh, extending be well beyond five minutes that I will be cutting you off right at five. It was at your request, not mine. So, uh, Councillor Fry, you're up. Thanks. Uh, so, first question, just on, on the whole... This original motion uh, contemplated 100 nurses attached to 100 police officers, and we're, we're not seeing that, which is great. And I think that the non-policing intervention is appropriate. Are we, should we expect more nurses attached to police officers as a phase two, or is this the, the kind of... Um, in uh, in v VCH's proposal, they focused on um, uh, an interdisciplinary response to mental health situations and crises. And so as you'll see in their proposal, their, their response teams include nurses as well as other types of professionals as well as peers, which are very important in the response. Um, and we do anticipate seeing um, uh, a fa the, the phase two funding request coming forward once phase one has been... Right, and I totally support this approach from BCH. I'm just wondering if, if, we've, if there's something else coming down the pipe that's more partnering more nurses with police as per the original motion? 100 and 100? No? No. It's not no. the intention? This is the, yeah, so okay. in response to the motion, VCH took it back, did their professional assessment, and came forward with this framework as Great. their recommended Great. approach that's, to this. That's, that's fantastic. Um, so on the subject of spaces, and I think that's a really critical distinction, and I appreciate Bob bringing that back mm -hmm. to us, because recognizing that crisis intervention and de-escalation on the street corner isn't going to work if people have nowhere to go and they're still hungry, they're still sick, they're still outside. Mm -hmm. Um, where do we go from here with that critical sort of intervention as a part, as a complement to this work? Mm -hmm. It's a really good question. The absolutely the need for more drop-in spaces, more social service spaces, is critical in the inner city neighborhoods, um, and it's something that uh, we're regularly in discussion with senior government partners about. Typically, the city's role in those types of services are we will try to bring the space if we have it in our in our space portfolio, um, but we do rely on senior government to bring that funding. Social services are the responsibility of senior government, and so uh, it's something that we're regularly in discussion with and. We'll continue that, and and as Bob noted, uh, it's really important for people to have an indoor space to go, and or as you see, um, uh, they end up um, they end up um, in an other unsuitable situations in alleys, sidewalks, parks. Right, but so that there's nobody stepping up to the plate right now, suggesting to to fund these spaces and including places for say safe inhalation and that kind of thing that we don't currently support enough of? We're certainly having discussions with, um, with senior government, with the province around the need for these spaces. Um, and it's, a, it's an active topic of discussion right now in relation to the work in the downtown east side. And, what, and, and so I know we, we, in the last term, we passed something that talked about activating some of the sort of more abundant kind of vacant spaces, in particular around Hastings Street. Mm -hmm. um, where does that work intersect with this sort of direction? 
So um, as part of the Hastings Street response, the city worked with, uh, with senior government funding support to open up two new spaces, one at uh, Hastings in Maine, which is operated by Aboriginal Front Door. And we repurposed um, a space, uh, a city space on Alexander that um, uh, the old Evelyn Saller Center with, again, with funding from the, uh, from the province through UBCM. And, um, and that's being operated by Watari. But those are, we do, we will need to think about the long-term uh, services in both those locations as well as additional space because what we yeah, what we have right now is not sufficient yeah okay um oh it just escaped me i'll jump back on it so we lost my train of thought thanks all right thank you very much uh councillor kirby young yeah uh thank you and thanks to staff for uh, and coastal health um as well as our team for the work um with respects to uh, the comment that was made in the presentation around this is the moderate de-escalation is the bulk of the response this year, um, and then the inclusion of the non-police response, and also the comment in terms of doubling the number of cars. just wanted to clarify the split. Um, I know it's referenced between CAR 87 and AOT in terms of where they sit on the risk um, response continuum, and just wonder if you can talk a little bit in real terms around what that looks like, what uh, time periods were left underserved with the current resources. For example, like, could we not service people on weekends after certain hours? So like, what will this actually look like in terms of being able to, somebody that, that needs that response, being able to have those folks going out? Sure, that's a good question. Um, we are uh, doubling the car for all the hours the car is currently operating for car 87, car 88. So uh, I can't remember the exact start, seven morning till 1130 at night, yeah seven days a week. So um, that will double the number of nurses and cars. There's one per shift. Uh, and now that will be two per shift for the entire span of that seven day week service. Okay. And then realistically, because I think a number of counselors have done uh, ride alongs uh, with some of the cars. Does that mean that you don't have people necessarily stacked up for hours or there's more calls that previously just had to go and answer it that can be serviced? Absolutely. So sometimes the calls come in to car 87 and we deploy the car there with someone uh, actively working with them. Other calls come in, they have to go back to other response. They may go to 911, they may go to somewhere else uh, to have a response. So our goal in this is to actually reduce the number that are actually diverted elsewhere and that we can continue to have a mental health nurse response as a forefront for these calls. Okay. Um, ideally so that they don't escalate and go further down that continuum and then require that yeah. higher level of intervention. That's right. Um, okay, I wonder too in the conversations and the dialogue, because I know this is an unprecedented step that we're taking, um, but Vancouver is not alone um, in seeing these issues. We're seeing them in across um, other cities in the province and across the country. In some of your conversations um, based on the outcomes, do you think this is something we could see expanding into other cities and other areas? Well, I think we haven't mentioned, but we've absolutely had the Ministry of Health, the Ministry of Health and Mental Health and Substance Use at the table with us in these conversations. They are absolutely very aware and supportive, as you know, the announcements last weekend, um, or sorry, two weekends ago, um, we are absolutely partnering with them on what that can, this can look like. I, I do think uh, in Vancouver, we have a more unique challenge in our inner city. Um, I'm not suggesting that doesn't happen elsewhere in other municipalities and areas of the, of the province, but I do think that uh, if we can really pulling together here and trying to address an unprecedented challenge in the city. Um, you mentioned the outcome based and um, that's the philosophy I think that we took in bringing forward the motion that we would be guided by evidence and sort of um, expertise when we're taking these recommendations from health. Um, and do you see potentially that we could shift strategy based on this um, in terms of if the police re non police response works, doesn't work, et cetera, if uh, we need to pair up, um, are we viewing this sort of with an open mind as to flexibility as to how this might iterate and develop over time? Yeah, absolutely. And I think the, uh, the reference group, as well as the external evaluation, just reinforces our commitment to make sure this is actually working to solve some of the challenges that we know uh, we have. Um, of reducing those visits? And triaging into hospital? Yeah, most everything that we do always is actually about the cost of all of our teams, the cost of acute care visits, et cetera, so for sure. Okay, super, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Boyle. Thanks. Can I start by moving for a second round of questions? Uh, sure. Um, Causing harm, but they're clearly not well, uh, and, and it's a disruption. Maybe it makes people uncomfortable. Right now, I know many things can happen, but right now, what would somebody do? What would the response be? Can you just walk us through sort of the current situation? Yeah. Well, currently right now, we actually don't have a lot of crisis response for that, what you described. And I think that is for them to reach out to us. Um, 
we certainly don't want to limit it to one phone number and then someone can't find that phone number. So we just need to be thoughtful about that. Okay. Um, so one of the things we heard from Stacey Ashton from the crisis uh, center when this motion first came forward was a situation they see where uh, where the response is police because of maybe on stimulants and they often clear from those stimulants in a few hours which is why they might be discharged back out to the community because they're in a better place so it isn't a black and white scenario on how people end up coming to new deteriorate and have to go to a hospital and that's not in their best interest nor ours Exactly. Um, my a housing crisis, that's why we're, we're looking for drop-in spaces. Many people are out on the street. Our response to, uh, to COVID-19 that Bob mentioned, not the virus. It just isn't natural to cut people off here. So thank you. Uh, Councillor Meisner. Yeah, thank you for the presentation and uh, very happy to see this uh, aspect uh, move forward. Um, but my question is around, uh, a little bit more around the hospital district. Community that actually really do make sure that transition happens. The warm handover happens, that the wraparound care happens for individuals that actually need it. Okay, but that's just to be clear, not for everyone who's being discharged from the ER with a mental health issue? It just depends on the circumstances and what their needs are. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so this initiative doesn't have any additional support for it's more up, it, it, It's more up front when someone's starting to de-escalate to get them into the right service, and it may not actually hopefully be acute care at all. Okay. Okay, thank you. Councillor Bly. Thanks very much. Um, so just a few questions to follow up. I uh, heard a few times now around drop-in spaces or somewhere for folks to be able to de-escalate and be supported by the, the um, you know, staff and in partnership with the VPD, I guess. But um, like, what can we actually do to help make this happen? We've clearly been able to do a lot with this grant and be able to use that collective advocacy and partnership. So. I'm wondering, because we keep hearing this, um, we've passed motions at council to enable more space, to provide supports and care for people in community. What's the block here that we could better understand to help um, sort of take this to the next level? Mm -hmm. uh, I'm, I'm not the only expert on this, so I'll welcome others to come up, but my initial comment would be, uh, I'm not so sure it's a block as opposed to uh, an awareness. Uh, through COVID, I think we've seen a lot of changes in how people congregate and uh, what's happened in some of our drop-ins, etc. Um, I also think the homelessness situation that we're dealing with is a factor here. And so I do think it's really up to uh, the municipal, the city, ourselves, BC Housing, our nonprofits to come together to try and understand how can we actually fill this void. Uh, with what services exist out there, or what do we need to actually bring forward to try and support this differently? I don't know if you want to add anything, Patty? Just briefly, I, I do think it was very positive that Mayor Sim and Council, when this, when this initiative was announced, were with the Premier, Premier Eby, and he referred to the Vancouver Charter and the Vancouver Agreement. I think we have to bring together all levels of government that are investing in the City of Vancouver in a number of ways. To Drop-in spaces is just one of many needs to look at how we are working together to address these needs. And certainly you've shown leadership in this regard, so thank okay, you. Okay, but just to, just to clarify, because you're right, there are many things we need to do, but we need to also um, do something sooner than later. So in terms of low-hanging fruit or what is that greatest need that would give us what is required to take this from 60% to 100%, for example, is it space or is it something else? Space is important. Yeah. Space, housing, they're related because a, of a course, lot of housing, housing we're always, will we're always space. working on housing. Yeah. But one of the challenges that people are out on the street with nowhere to go. So, okay. Steps to address. Even that. though they have housing, they still need somewhere to congregate and connect. That's and right. That's right. For that social connection. Okay, great. So, that's good to know. Thank you. Um, just to follow up to the questions uh, to Councillor Boyle. Sort of talking about this line of communication, um, is is it the intent that there will be new um, sort of um, guidelines or directions given to ecom in the instance that there's a 911 call that would be best suited to this type of response? Yeah, we absolutely think that uh, we probably need to clarify some of the pathways or the approaches that we have within these systems. Um, we'll be working with a lot of the housing providers, the nonprofits, et cetera, just to make sure it's really clear on how they access services, the businesses. Just to be really clear, if somebody sees somebody distressed in a park and finds it upon themselves to call 911, does 911 get new instructions rather than just yeah. calling police? Do you want to? Yeah, that is our intention. 
that's our intention is to work with them around this. Because I think a lot of the calls do come in through 911. That's often what the public do. So they're just going to default to that. Yeah. They're not going to go find another. Absolutely. Number. Yeah. Okay. So just making sure that that's really clear. That, yes. Yeah. Okay. Good. We've already been having some of those conversations with VPD and others. So. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. And I just want to mention a comment back to your I earlier. I just have another question. He Afterwards? Can, yeah. Okay. <laughs> so Meisner can go back on the Your list. five minutes. <laughs> That's how this works. Great. Um, what about in the issue of waiting for paramedics? So I know CAR 87 at times can find themselves um, waiting for quite some time um, for support if they're well, they have a transport vehicle themselves that they need to take people to the uh, to emergency. But how is this working in terms of with uh, any potential delays with paramedics response or others in order to get people into emergency if that's what they need? Thanks for that question. So all of our uh, CAR 87, 88 cars are equipped to transport people to the hospital because, as I'm sure you all know, we have had some challenges with BCHS over the last year or so in relation to response times. So in response to that, we have been coming up with different ways to make sure that people get the care they need and get transported to hospital. And one of those ways is to make sure that our, uh, our CAR 8788 cars in particular, but we also have a number of other cars that are now on the road uh, in our regular fleet that are able to transport people to the hospital, which of course is not ideal. Mm -hmm. um, at least the CAR 8788 cars are unmarked mm -hmm. um, because we don't want to find ourselves in a position where we're transporting people, for example, in a police wagon. Thank you very much. That's my time. Awesome. Thank you. Right on time. Uh, Councillor Carr. Great. Thanks. Thanks so much, Mayor. Um, my first question is around uh, the fact that you have, uh, Vancouver Coastal Health has suggested a range of professionals. Um, so not just nurses, but those other professionals. Are those the sort of, you did, I think, three categories or, you know, of, of kinds of professionals, including, I think you said peer or street care. Is that what you mean when you say the range yeah. of people? Okay. Yeah. These teams will be made up of nurses, social workers, community liaison workers, and peers. Great. Okay. And can you just confirm again, how many nurses are you expecting to be able to hire? The exact number? I don't want to misquote. <laughs> it's okay. We can get that for you. Yeah, that's, that's great. God. I know my, our son's a mental health nurse. They are short-staffed yes. everywhere. Yeah. Um, secondly, you said it would take time to hire the teams. Uh, how much time? Can you do it in this budget year? Uh, well, the reason we don't have 100 nurses coming forward and the reason we have a phase two, which is the wraparound care um, that's coming in later years, is we don't think we feasibly can do all this in one calendar year. Um, and you'll see that in the, uh, uh, the budget ask, um, it's really scaling it up over time. It takes us a while to hire these teams uh, to find space for them, as I mentioned. We don't even have job postings on the board yet. So it's going to take us a while to get there, and that's why I think it's going to be delayed through the year. Thank you. So that just so, so we can read it into the mic. That was out of the twenty-five nurses out of the fifty-eight. Great. Thank you. Um, third question really is related to the point you just made about wraparound care. I think most people who are um, very much affected by um, and concerned about this issue want to know not just what the emergency or the um, immediate responses to a crisis, uh, but then if somebody is ready to go into some more comprehensive treatment, what are the bed availabilities for that and the timing of the bed availabilities. Can you maybe speak to um, how you are working with the provincial government um, around, uh, more generally? I know you are the provincial government, but, yeah, uh, <laughs> but more generally. Absolutely. Um, uh, around that. Sure. Uh, we've been working very closely with the provincial government, both ministries of uh, Ministry of Health and Ministry of Mental Health and Substance Use. Uh, you may be aware that the Road to Recovery was announced some time ago, which is going to bring some more uh, withdrawal or detox beds online in Vancouver, as well as some treatment beds uh, and some more uh, wraparound care teams for individuals who are needing to uh, go through services around their substance use disorder. Um, many of our teams right now uh, do outreach, like large numbers of our teams are doing outreach into buildings, into shelters, uh, into housing units. And many of our housing units, particularly with the complex care housing that was announced about a year ago, uh, also have embedded supports in those models. Some of the modulars that have come online have 
health-supported beds in them, um, where we have staff seven days a week. So I, I think there's multiple ways that we can provide that wraparound care for people, uh, depending on what their needs are. And a lot of the population we're talking about in, in those models is our mental health and substance use disorder population. How, how many beds have been made available, those more comprehensive, you know, long-term care or even shorter term, but at least, you know, in-situ uh, care beds, the detox beds? With, how many more has Vancouver got in the last year? Yeah, you know, off the top of my head, we'd have to get back to you on that, um, Councillor Carr. Right. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I am interested. I mean, that's a it's a robust solution. I think we're looking for in this piece yeah. that you're addressing today. We absolutely can get you some of that information. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Councillor Joe. Okay. Thanks. Thanks, Mayor, and uh, thanks for the team uh, move this forward. So I want to ask a couple of questions to our medical experts. I think you uh, talked about this before, but I want to ask this question again in a public situation. So, in a very high risk situation, is it possible to deploy the healthcare uh, team without the support from the Vancouver Police Department, and why? Do you want to answer that, JJ? Sure. That's a great question. Um, if you would ask our very experienced healthcare professionals and, uh, and workers and nurses, they would say no. They're going to very, um, uh, they're going to situations where there are multiple variables, and many of those variables um, can contribute to a, a very risky situation. So even in scenarios, even in hospitals, you'll have incidents where, where um, nurses can become be get hurt. Uh, and that's in a situation where those variables are controlled. So if you're if you're meeting somebody for the first time in a scenario, which might be on the street, you might have crystal methamphetamine involved, which is um, ever prevalent in in in, in the city. Uh, that could be quite a concerning scenario. So uh, our nurses will would tell us that no, they're not feeling safe enough to go out there by themselves. And additionally, if there is a situation where somebody does need to be brought to hospital, uh, we need the police to, as a mechanism to bring them to the, to the hospital setting. Okay, so then how do you think the partnership with the Vancouver Police Department will enhance the, uh, the, the, the service we provide to the people there? Uh, sorry, just, just to clarify, how, how does investment enhance the service? With the partnership with the Vancouver Police Department. Correct. So, you know, the, the car is a one-off sort of interaction and really responding to crisis. And so these other tiers that we're building into the system um, speak into the importance of relationship building with clients in the community. Uh, much of what is positive that happens in healthcare happens because of good relationship with the clients and the, and the patients that we take care of. So if there are, um, with, with these new tiers, we're able to uh, develop those relationships. And over time, I think we're, uh, when we are responding, we might know somebody who's struggling, you know, some call comes in and, and some one on one of our team says, okay, we actually know that person, we're going to go out. So maybe we don't need a police response in that scenario. So over time, we're hoping for this shift uh, to the, the, that kind of scenario. Okay, good. Uh, the other questions I want to ask about uh, the evaluation plan. I think you touched a little bit in the presentation, but what specific KPI you are looking for and when the, uh, the council will be able to see the evaluation results? Yeah, okay, fair enough. So I think in, it, we're under development in terms of those KPIs. We have, um, especially for the car. Yeah, so we have health and police data that we look at now for our other programs, such as ACT and AOT, and we're going to see how that applies for this particular program. Okay, so when the council will be able to see some uh, preliminary results? That's correct. So when? Oh, so when? Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, I don't know. I think that's going to be in progress as well. Be not before later this year. Yeah. Okay, not before later. Okay, that's all my question. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor Joe. Um, Councillor Dominato. Uh, thanks, Mayor. And uh, thank you to staff uh, and all the partners for the presentation this morning. I have a couple of follow-up questions. Many of them were asked around space and as well as uh, triage and, and referral. But I, I do want to follow up on the evaluation questions. Um, what I heard is that likelihood is having some evaluation outcome data at the end of this year. Did I hear that correctly? Yeah. Or maybe you could expand in general on the evaluation um, program and what that yeah. looks like over the next three and a half years. That would sure. Be 
<laughs> current understanding of that. Yeah, so I'm Caitlin Etherington. Uh, I work on Bob's team as a director with Vancouver Community, really focused on supported housing, but I've also been leaning in around this work. And I think the timeline around the evaluation is really important. We're going to be bringing together a group of people to kind of guide the evaluation, including our Indigenous health team and the city and the VPD. We'll have to kind of go to some kind of a RFP process to find an external evaluator who can do this and together develop those KPIs. In terms of access to the, to the CAR data, it's a little bit more straightforward because those programs are already operating. But in terms of like bringing in an Indigenous approach, again, that's something that's going to develop over the year. So we're just going to have to be really thoughtful about when we actually start evaluating. Um, the moderate de-escalation response, we're not anticipating to launch really until the fall because it's a lot of work to get a team like that up and running. And so if you think that we're going to start that work in the fall, we're not going to want to evaluate outcomes until way into next year. So it's going to be hopefully very robust and collaborative, but actually bringing back concrete results will take a little bit of time. So I just want to be very realistic about that. And there will also be a component of it where we'll have to look at qualitative data somehow, and that's the expertise we'll be looking for, for with that uh, third-party evaluator. I really appreciate that clarification because I recognize in, in one, you've, you've included evaluation from the outset, which is really important in this, and the you know, outputs are different than outcomes in terms of getting that longitudinal yeah. data. Um, would it be possible, do you envision um, an opportunity to, um, once we start collecting some of that data, uh, be able to report back to council on a some sort of regular basis. Um, is there an opportunity for that in this? Absolutely. I mean, that's the, that's the that's a point. It's written into the grant agreement, I believe. So that's absolutely our expectation. Okay, yeah. fantastic. I have um, one other question. Um, you referenced it, and it was on my list. Was around. Could you expand on uh, the indigenous approaches? It, I, I think um, was a really important part of the framework presented by VCH to City Council, and just interested to better understand what that will look like in terms of policy, but also in practice and, and on the ground. So we, thank you for that question, and we have an Indigenous health team at Vancouver Coastal Health um, who will be leading that work. They're not here today, unfortunately, um, to speak to the process, but we have had lots of conversations with them, and, and the reason in the proposal that's kind of vague is because they really want to do it in partnership with their community partners. So they're understanding that they need to, um, you know, I, I think there's already existing tables that they're going to lean into and their, their elder uh, in residence program, but they need to do some consultation on what their community is saying this, this needs to look like. So we've kept it broad in terms of strengthening our approaches across our urgent mental health and substance use systems because we're waiting to hear back from that group of experts around what that should look like. To be a little bit more concrete, it could look like expanding some Indigenous specific teams that exist. And it could look like having more positions on some of our other teams that particularly bring in that cultural approach to care. It could look like edu more education across all of our teams, but we're really, we're not sure exactly and we need a little bit of time to hear back from that group and to do that engagement in a really um, thoughtful way. Absolutely, I appreciate that. Um, and then final question is um, sort of bigger picture. With the um, information that and, and, well, the interventions that will definitely be undertaken as part of the different parts of this work, whether it be de-escalation or the AOTs or the CAR 788, is there an opportunity to inform broader public policy around prevention and early intervention? Because I think we know, like, we're catching people when at the intervention level. But do we? Is there an opportunity through this work? Do you think, and maybe that is part of the evaluation of informing the upstream? And could you comment on that, gents, generally? I think what I would say is maybe. Yeah, I just I can't think through it. And anymore. you're saved by the bell. <laughs> <laughs> That five minutes is like coming in handy now, let me tell you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Montague. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Uh, appreciate all the questions and all the responses. Um, makes uh, my list of questions much shorter. Um, uh, I just wanted to clarify one thing. You mentioned uh, that the need for police to bring people to the hospital is a requirement. I just want to confirm, you're talking about statutory requirements? 
Yeah, so the, the part of the Mental Health Act that um, the police would engage is called Section 28. And um, that's where uh, if the, the VPD feel that an individual is at risk to themselves or others due to a mental health issue, they can bring them to hospital. And at that point where they would be um, assessed by the, the, head, the health team. So that's the statutory component. And there's no other option other than... There's certainly, certainly we would uh, interface with an individual who appears to be going through a struggle. And if the health um, partners on that team felt that this individual could benefit from that team, uh, from that, uh, from being seen in hospital, then the first approach would be to ask them and see if there was a voluntarily, a voluntary way for them to come. For involuntary. Yeah, preferred there's 100%. No, there's no other option. Right. Uh, no other option that I can think of. Yeah. Okay. Um, and the other thing I wanted to do is just is someone able to elaborate a little bit on a cooperative relationship right now between the VPD and Vancouver Coastal Health with regards to things like um, information sharing and and the aspects around that. So I think I think we're very uh, fortunate in Vancouver Coastal Health and specifically Vancouver where we have uh, a couple of police health partnerships already. One, a couple were mentioned the assertive outreach team, as well as the um, uh, sort of community treatment teams. And so those are um, entities that are primarily health driven, but we have our police partnerships there. So uh, I mentioned before the what we, uh, relationship. And so these are individuals that work uh, very closely with our VPD partners. And when information is required, we're able to access that information through those, uh, those partnerships and uh, is, can be relevant to the health presentations. Okay. Um, thank you. And then I guess uh, I got lots of time, so I would love to hear the doctor's response to uh, Councillor Meisner's. Uh, you mentioned that you had a, uh, a thought that you couldn't get out last time, so I'd love to hear it. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Just to stay on your five minutes around the uh, health agreements, we actually have formalized agreements for information sharing between the VPD and Vancouver Coastal Health, and I, th I think it's quite unique in the province. Um, but back to your comment earlier, I didn't mention uh, around the uh, discharge support, people transitioning out of acute care. If you look at our phase two approach, it is to intensify some of our uh, wraparound teams, what we call our ICMT teams or our intensive case management teams, um, to really support an uh, increased number of people that we know are going to probably struggle that we want to make sure actually have that support around it. So that really is our phase two, which won't come down the line for some time. I didn't mention that earlier. So. Come here. Thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Fry. Thanks, Mayor. Um, yeah, so I'm curious about the uh, uh, public facing side to this. Um, some will remember in the last uh, council session, we talked about crisis intervention and de escalation and tools for the public to intervene. So, where we see shopkeepers having to open their shop in the morning and there's somebody sleeping in the doorway, for instance, or somebody who's coming into a shop or a restaurant with mental health crisis um, and, and how we can better equip citizens and, and residents and shopkeepers and the like. Mm -hmm. Thank you. We are in the process of, um, of implementing the Better Together Neighborhood Collaboration Pilot. Um, and uh, through that pilot, we're working in four neighborhoods and providing training to uh, BIA members and other members of the, of the community in, in, um, in uh, general information around homelessness, intergenerational trauma, de-escalation techniques. And we're doing that in partnership with Homelessness Services Association of BC. So we are planning a, an update to council on that implementation in the coming months and we'll, we can provide more information then. So, but there's not an explicit role for VCH uh, within that sector as part of the education component? Um, VCH is uh, invited to the community tables in those uh, in those uh, pilot neighborhoods. We're kind of recreating the, the old neighborhood integrated service team uh, tables there uh, um, and certainly that's something we can explore. Okay. And, and, and sort of in follow-up to that, how are we um, connecting some of this work with some of our other frontline responders specifically? I know, um, and Councillor Boyle and I met with the Portland Street Response Team, and they're operating out of the, the, the Portland Fire Rescue. And similarly, obviously, we have ambulance paramedics who are attending mm -hmm. people potentially in distress. Is there some kind of intersection here where we can involve fire rescue, in, you know, in, in this capacity? Um. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's, a, there's an active partnership between, yeah, Vancouver Coastal Health and Fire Ready, and we work very closely with them. Is there a particular... Well, I mean, obviously, our fire rescue mm -hmm. attends the majority of overdoses. Yes. Uh, and, and so they have that sort of... And I yes. know we were... We had a component that was, was doing a follow-up, I think, with the fire chief was going to attend folks in the aftermath. And I'm just curious how any of this work might intersect with some of the work already going with Vancouver. Uh, well, that, that program is still underway. It's... Uh, uh, when fire attend an overdose, and that person does not go to hospital with Vancouver Coastal Health outreach staff. They they will attend and make a connection to that person in the days following the overdose. This has been a successful program in being able to engage people who might not otherwise be engaged in care. So I think there are multiple. This is another way. This is primarily around people who are at risk of of overdose, uh, and because that's the the type of clients attended by Vancouver Fire. So and that will continue. But we do know that there is a, an intersection of sort of dual, di I don't know if we still call it dual diagnosis or yeah. that, that sort of mental health and addictions intersection. And, and Yes, there is. And uh, th there's lots of work underway with our mental health and substance use teams to integrate the work that we do. But for Vancouver Fire in particular, they are responding primarily to the overdoses. So that when they connect to the with the person post-overdose, that person may require mental health services as well. And it will be Vancouver Coastal Health's responsibility to make the appropriate connection to those services. Okay, great, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Councillor Boyle. Thanks, I'm just hoping to follow up with city staff on the question of, of implementing the Healthy City strategy. This before us is th $3 million uh, in a grant. Now, I know we have the operating budget coming up. I'm just wondering in recognition of the, the scale of these challenges, what other investments could we be looking at um, in our toolbox? Uh, Mary Claire Zach, Managing Director of Social Policy, and thank you for the question. So just to elaborate on what um, Dr. Daly said, one of the things that she always says that I always repeat is that the antidote to um, mental health crisis is early childhood education and supports and those that are culturally safe uh, for communities. So. Um, that's something that we should always be investing in. Uh, to be more specific, I think when we're looking at a little bit more upstream, um, we need to be thinking about income. I mean, th th these are things that the, the city doesn't have jurisdiction or control over, but things like income supports are really, really important for people in poverty because um, we do see that confluence. Supports for youth leaving care, for example, would be a very targeted way um, to support those youth leaving care when we know that a significant proportion of them do end up in our homelessness counts, right? So those are the kinds of things that I think we should be looking at um, going forward. Great. Thank you. Is there a, um, an update on the Healthy City strategy that this new council will get? Is there something scheduled for us? Uh, what we're doing is we're looking at the renewal of that strategy. So as we take steps to to do that work, we'll we'll certainly be updating you and working closely with our partners at Vancouver Coastal Health. I think the other thing I want to add to your question is that we need to recognize that post well we're still in a, in the pandemic and we're still in the overdose crisis as it's evolved. But people on the lower end of the income scale, those who are living in poverty, actually fared much worse than the rest of us in lots and lots of different ways. So I think when we're seeing higher incidents of mental health, higher numbers of people on the street, we just have to keep that in mind that this is part of our response to that crisis and to that emergency. Appreciate that. My last question might also be for you. Um, I, I'm just wondering, you no, know, this was touched on, but what are the next steps in terms of bringing a PACT program to Vancouver? Well, our next steps, what we've done so far is we've certainly looked at all the other programs that are operating in the province and elsewhere and evaluated those and, and assessed those. And we've done some research also, peer-based research on what are some of the things and components and elements that would be you know, important for people in terms of, of feeling decriminalized and that kind of thing. So our next steps are to actually work with Vancouver Coastal Health and Canadian Mental Health Association. We actually have a, a meeting scheduled for the next couple of weeks to see what does that implementation look like in Vancouver. Great. Yep. Glad to hear it. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Clausen. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, my questions are to the Vancouver Coastal Health folks. Uh, first of all, I think uh, we should really acknowledge um, 
the robust response we've seen both from uh, the Ministry of Health and uh, from the Coastal Health staff and board. I think uh, we know that the genesis of, of, this, uh, of this initiative uh, fundamentally arrived at a campaign promise by, uh, during the election. Um, I realize and I'm sort of hearing that we are trying to adjust um, our approach through uh, the experience of COVID and the changing nature of the opioid crisis and poison drug supply. Um, the question is, if we hadn't come forward with this funding, would Coastal Health be doing programs in a similar fashion like this? Well, first of all, we, we greatly appreciate the funding and the focus on here. Uh, the, the provincial government, the Ministry of Mental Health, Ministry of and Addictions, the Ministry of Health, have been making investments in uh, new services for people with mental health challenges, substance use challenges, but the, the need is great. There's much more work to be done. We've seen a, a real increase, as JJ talked about and others have talked about, in people presenting to our hospitals with mental health issues. Of course, we have growing numbers of people now actually at risk of illicit drug toxicity overdose, even though over 11,000 people have died. So there, there have been provincial investments, and we would have continued to make those, but we really appreciate these investments as well, which have a slightly different focus and focus on a priority for the city of Vancouver. Um, so just further to that, if we see some um, very positive results from this program, and I heard the questions around data collection, um, would this be something you would consider outside of the city of Vancouver and some of the other municipalities that you uh, serve under Coastal Health? Well, at the announcement uh, last weekend, Minister uh, Whiteside, actually, the Minister of Mental Health and Addiction, said that she is quite interested, and she's a data-driven person in the evaluation of this initiative, as it may uh, uh, help inform investments in other locations as well. And many municipalities around the province are struggling with similar populations. Okay, I have one more question for you, Dr. Daly. Um, there's been a number of uh, criticisms and questions around the staffing question as to where we're going to find the, the, the human resources to uh, address this programming. Um, the communication I've been getting from you sounds fairly confident that being able to hire these positions. Can you confirm um, that uh, whether you are planning to redeploy existing staff, hire new staff, and, and, your, and maybe uh, re-emphasize your level of confidence in being able to staff these positions? Well, I think what I've said, and Bob Chapman alluded to this, it will take time to fill these positions. We do have a, a health human resource crisis in BC. We also have a very robust plan to address that, put forward from Minister Dix. And we do know that the, the staff who are interested in, in this type of work, for example, the nurses, are different than those nurses who may want to work in an operating room or a primary care clinic. There are very, very committed staff to our current programs in the downtown east side. For example, one of the nurses came to the announcement last week. She'd been working on the team for over 20 years. So our, our HR department is confident they can recruit staff. It will take a few months to recruit those staff. Thank you for the responses. And thank you for, again, the robust, robust response to this program. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, seeing no more questions, um, I'd like to remind speakers that they have five minutes to make their comments. It should state whether they are in support or in opposition of the recommendations and may only speak once. Council members have up to three minutes to ask questions to speakers. However, speakers are under no obligation to respond. I will also ask if the speakers are residents of Vancouver if it is not noted on the speakers list. We'll now hear from our uh, only uh, registered speaker, Stacy Anton. Stacy, are you on the phone? Yes, I am. You can hear me, right? We can hear you. Awesome. Uh, so I'm Stacy Ashton. I'm from the BC Crisis Line Network and the Vancouver-based Crisis Center. Um, I, uh, I'm, I am not a resident of Vancouver, but I work in Vancouver, and um, <coughs> I'm going to say other in terms of uh, of of, of a of opposed or supportive. So um, I really want to thank the council for the for adapting your initial motion to uh, include um, routing mental health crisis calls through crisis lines and investing in civilian-led mental health crisis teams. I know those aren't the sections of the motion under consideration today, but as you're seeing in the approach that Vancouver Coastal Health is 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 uh, is putting forward, that is the vision that they have. 
Uh, in reviewing their recommendations, the thing that stands out most is that only 10 full-time employees are requested for co-response police psychiatric nurse teams, which is a lot less than the 100 psychiatric nurses that were envisioned by the original motion. Um, and uh, 32 of the 58 FDEs recommended are specifically for non-police de-escalation units. This is not surprising. In September 2022, the province commissioned a rapid in- investigation into repeat offending and random stranger violence. These are the these are the individuals that um, that are the basis of a lot of the concerns that um, this council has brought forward. Um, that report made it clear, and it was based on VPD statistics, interviews with Vancouver police, Crown councils, mental health professionals, that increased policing, including CAR 8788 co-responses, does uh, does not actually end up with the small minority of individuals whose mental illness or substance use issues result in violence uh, being served well. The, the tendency is to bring those folks to hospitals, and the hospitals don't have the ability to resolve the issue. As Mr. Chapman said, folks who come in activated by substance use tend to be discharged once they become calm, but according to the Rapid Investigation Report, those people are most at risk. In the best case, they survive to be picked up by a car again. In worst cases, the person commits a violent crime, which opens up forensic care options that are not available outside the criminal justice system, or they die by suicide, after which the police will send a letter of concern to the BC coroner asking why that person was released from hospital. For the vast majority of people in mental health crisis who are nonviolent, police involvement in a mental health crisis will continue to be unnecessary and unwelcome. But we don't have a path or buy-in from 911 to use non-police responses. Um, most people are brought, who are brought to hospital under a mental health apprehension are nonviolent, but they're treated as though they might become violent at any time. Direct 911 police diversion at the source is a place where city council can make a difference. Your city contracts with Ecom 911, the protocols that guide what kind of calls are dispatched to police versus other responses are under city jurisdiction. In Toronto, the city worked with their police department and staff to build the referral protocols to the 24-7 Toronto Community Crisis Service, and that pathway goes from 911 to a crisis line, which allows phone-based de-escalation as the starting place. The bottom line is, is if we continue equipping, authorizing, and resourcing to police to respond to mental health crisis, they will remain our main frontline mental health caregivers. We know this isn't effective, but once you're the one doing the frontline work, it is very hard to know when it's not your job. You're hearing from your community, your health authorities, and from your own police officers that we need a different path. Uh, I encourage you to revisit the commitment you've made to policing solutions in light of the recommendations you're seeing from Vancouver Coastal Health, and also to build out that pathway from 911 and police to police alternatives. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much. And I think I might have referred to you as Stacy Anton. If I did that, I, I, I apologize. Um, it's Stacy Ashton. <laughs> um, and you have questions from Councillor Carr. Uh, thanks so much, Stacey, for calling in. I really appreciate that and the work that you do. Um, you didn't, um, and, and you outlined, I think, um, some options really well here, but um, I would appreciate a little bit more detail on uh, right now, currently, um, in terms of diverted calls. What is your call, call val- volume um, in our in our region, and um, and if you could provide an estimate of um, how many um, of those calls resolve in um, sort of the de-escalation of the situation mm-hmm. to the point where no other first responders are required to uh, to attend. Mm-hmm. So uh, we receive calls currently directly from community through the 310-6789 number and the 1-800-SUICIDE number, and about 1.5% of the calls we get uh, require some kind of in-person intervention. Um, we are only, the only thing available to us right now is 911, and that tendency is to go through police uh, and uh, and. Um, 
in half the times that we do have to call for an in-person intervention, it is uh, by the caller's consent. They are prepared for the intervention. Um, they are nonviolent, uh, and uh, uh, but the the outcome is the same. They're still seeing a police officer on the, on their front step uh, or at their door, uh, and and having to go through that process. Um, in terms of when you add 911 calls in, uh, the, what they're finding in Toronto and other communities is that you can divert about 80% of your 911 mental health calls to crisis lines and have them resolved over the phone. Okay, and what was that volume of calls? That you mentioned? I mean, our volume of calls right now, oh, sorry, our volume, We are in Vancouver, we're taking 45, uh, we are receiving 100,000 calls a year. We are answering 45,000 calls a year. We expect that uh, that's where we're having the capacity crunch. Um, the investment that we're seeing in other parts of the mental health system and policing system to create safer communities is not necessarily showing up uh, on, uh, to enhance crisis line capacity, which is unfortunate because we do have uh, an incredibly high de-escalation rate and a success rate at working with folks in mental health crisis. And are you working with Vancouver Coastal Health in terms of um, uh, being one option around emergency response? We're working with the provincial health authority right now, uh, and I would love to see crisis lines be at more of these tables. We we tend to be um, because we're open access to everyone. I think we tend to be uh, um, uh, used quite often, but not uh, not used strategically in the way that we should be and, to address and sorry, these Stacey, uh, Your your time's up. I apologize for that. Thank you. Sure, no problem. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, okay, uh, so seeing uh, no further questions, uh, this is the end of our speakers uh, list uh, for this item. Thank you for addressing council. Would someone like to move a motion? Councillor Dominato, thank you. Is there a seconder? Councillor Kirby Young, thank you. Council, is there any discussion? And I see Councillor Boyle, you're up. Thanks. Uh, I want to thank the Vancouver Coastal team uh, and uh, and the whole team they've worked with for bringing back such a um, thoughtful, comprehensive response. I think, you know, we all wrestle with uh, witnessing our neighbors struggling around us um, and uh, and trying to figure out what the right responses are. And, and and of course, like so many issues we wrestle with at the local level, knowing it's not traditionally in our jurisdiction, but these are our neighbors and uh, and they need our support. And so really appreciate the, uh, the whole array of responses that you've brought back to us based on your, your deep knowledge and expertise, the expertise of your teams on this work. Um, I, uh, and I really appreciate the way that you have um, fit this recommendation into our broader work in implementing the Healthy City Strategy and the connection to those important upstream investments uh, as part of a comprehensive approach. I particularly uh, am glad to see that spectrum of services and just want to um, recognize Councillor Fry's amendment to the initial report and in, uh, in our caller Stacey Ashton's um, input. Uh, the, and the community work in recognizing that broad continuum of supports that are needed that we see uh, a good portion of outlined in this report. I think that's really important. Uh, I also am glad to see a robust evaluation in it. Again, I think in wanting to find solutions to these challenges and, and help support the people struggling most, that evaluation and adjustments are really important. And so I was glad to bring that amendment forward to the initial uh, motion and see it supported unanimously. I think those are all improvements that will get us to actual solutions to the challenges that we face. And I'm grateful to be working with partners who, uh, who are so committed to this work to, to see it happen. So happy to support it. Sorry, Councillor Kirby Young. Yeah, thanks, Mayor. Um, I just want to start by thanking all of the staff that uh, worked on this, and I, uh, um, both at City of Vancouver, but also particularly um, our partners from Coastal Health, Vancouver PD, 
um, and everybody that has input into it. Um, and extraordinary times do require extraordinary measures. And as was referenced by some of the health professionals from Coastal Health, that while we do see a lot of these issues starting uh, to become more prevalent in some other cities, that they are acute um, in the city of Vancouver and in the inner city particularly. And I think that this um, action um, and unprecedented, I could say, and it's bold, um, really speaks to the fact that we have a crisis level of folks that are falling through the cracks in our city and a desire to ensure that they are provided with help and support, but that we are also working to mitigate the increasing impacts that we see um, of those folks that are falling through the cracks um, in general um, on everybody's health and well-being in the city of Vancouver. Um, I think it's particularly important to note that we heard very strongly from the experts that we needed to have a health-based response that could tie people to needed services. And that was a really important component of it, um, that we find a way to not just have hopefully that de-escalation before people get into severe crisis, but that we have a way to connect them onto services to help people stabilize um, and hopefully to put them onto a path because um, that's where people fall through the gaps when they're in acute crisis or perhaps when they may be ready for help and they don't know how to find it or there's an interim gap until they can get into services and treatment. And I think that's really a recognition of this. I do think that this is a very balanced approach. Um, it centers a lot of Indigenous um, knowledge and perspective and a recognition um, of our Indigenous peoples being the most impacted segment um, disproportionately in the city of Vancouver. And I'm proud that Council is taking this action. I do think we need to stress that it's an evidence and an outcome based. Um, and so we're going to have to keep our foot on that pedal, but um, it's going to take a little bit of time until we have the appropriate framework to gather that data with the KPIs. And the other thing I think I'm going to make note of and ask people for is a bit of faith and patience um, as we're going down a new route uh, that it will be iterative and develop. And we hear from um, our partners at VPD and in fact from the social service partners themselves that two thirds of I think roughly of the, the number of the initiated mental health calls actually come from a mental health professional who are not comfortable attending on their own. So to me, it's never been an either or, um, that it's, you know, you know, police response is bad or a mental health one is the only one. It's actually a combination of being able to have um, a broad base set of tools um, where we can deploy the appropriate resources um, as best we can. And there's calibration in that in terms of trying to affect the right balance on that. Um, but obviously it's, uh, I think a happy situation when we can find that non-police response or we can de-escalate people before they get into that acute level of crisis. So um, I am really appreciate all the work. Um, I think it's going to be a bit of learning together and it is sort of unprecedented, I think, to see everybody working towards this. So I really appreciate also the province's investment um, in stepping up uh, with us here and hopefully this will be a model that um, can be um, extrapolated out to other cities um, so that we can actually work to mitigate some of these problems. And I, I hope to see some of those stats start to show some downward trend in some of the acute outcomes, such as hospital visits and people that just have had this sort of recurring, almost revolving door, if you will, sometimes through hospitals, but we haven't been able to get them to a better place. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I guess it's me. Do you have to see, the, I have to see the chair, don't I? Can I please see the chair to Councillor Carr? Awesome, thank you very much. Uh, I, I do think it's hard to overemphasize the gravity of this grant and the positive impact that it will have uh, on our community. And yeah, it, it, it's bold, it's a new way of thinking. Um, and it's gonna be hard. I think we need to acknowledge that, but that's okay because you know um, we're living in challenging times and we have a lot of challenges, so rethink rethinking the way we do things and acknowledging it's going to be hard. Um, that's okay. And we have an opportunity to set a new standard in North America for a modern and, and a compassionate approach towards addressing complex um, issues, um, you know, when it comes to public health and safety. And this actually strengthens, uh, you know, our, uh, sorry, Indigenous approaches to how we uh, deal with these uh, mental health challenges as well in a more culturally appropriate manner. So I, I, I think this is absolutely great. Um, obviously, I'm, I'm going to be supporting it. Uh, I do uh, believe that 
this is another example of how governments, uh, different levels of government, uh, you know, they can highlight challenges and we can put partisanship aside and we can deal with what residents want us to deal with. And I do want to um, acknowledge all the incredible work that Vancouver Coastal, uh, the VPD have done on this. You've taken the, the ball and you've run with it and you've put a lot of thought and hard work into it and really appreciate it. I uh, also do want to give a shout out uh, to Pre, uh, Premier Eby and the BC government uh, for their leadership and, and helping us with this and uh, embracing it. Um, this wouldn't have been possible without them as well. So, uh, you know, I, I'm, you know I, I'm super optimistic that, uh, that you know, this, this initiative is going to, you know, it's a great step forward in dealing with the challenges that we have. And uh, I couldn't be more thankful to everything, like all the hard work that you put into this. So thank you very much. Uh, can I get the chair back, please? <laughs> I just had to press the button there. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Councillor Bly. Thanks very much, Mayor. Um, yeah, so I just want to uh, add my voice to the list of people, groups, uh, stakeholders that um, need acknowledgement. And uh, I think part of that too is Vancouverites who heard a very loud and clear, um, sort of bold, different approach to how we could tackle some of the um, most critical challenges in our city, which is related to um, mental health crisis, um, particularly with vulnerable folks and seeing that there could be a better way forward um, than what we've been currently doing. And so I, I don't want to um, leave um, the resident population of our city out who, who weighed into this during a really tough um, last couple of years um, expressing concern and wanting to see change. So um, in that list, of course, is the province Ministry of Health uh, Vancouver Coastal Health um, for your ongoing work with the City of Vancouver to try and um, support different ways of thinking about these challenges and how we can go beyond the status quo and also to our City of Vancouver staff who really are right there with the front lines uh, services, you know, meeting with groups day to day and how tiring that can be to sort of hold some sort of hope that we could get together and come um, to a better outcome. So all that to say, I think that um, the courage that it takes to look at a very complex challenge and try something new in a very public way um, can't be understated. And they are, um, it is our health partners that are, are taking this. And also to um, the Vancouver Police Department for also recognizing the need to modernize um, our response to mental health calls and crises and, and how, again, we can continue to partner and, and go beyond the rhetoric that we hear um, publicly, which can oftentimes lack empathy and compassion and understanding for what's really going on. Um, so, you know, I really appreciate that what this report brings forward, what this grant does is no more status quo. It's elevating our response. I think we're going to learn a lot this year. Um, and so I look, really look forward to regular updates as much as possible so that it's not just a decision that happens today that then we move on to other things and take our eye off that ball. Like, I really think that this requires uh, regular updates and leaning into how things are going, uh, whether it's the, the response through 911 calls and how the public comes to understand responses or that, those outreach programs, or what it's like to connect with operators in SROs and how that this could provide different and better options for those operators to deal with some of the complex um, challenges that they deal with on a regular basis. There's so much to learn from this program. And to my colleague's point, um, and I've spoken to many uh, other municipalities, Toronto, Montreal, they're watching to see what the outcomes of this program could really be um, in, in the impacts, the positive impact. So I think that that is all great. The last thing I'll say is my takeaway from this conversation is we need to figure out a way to find some space. I can't say enough how much I have heard about this on every level. We supported a motion for a recovery community center that was focused on people who are looking for other options, looking for um, more outreach, but also looking for somewhere where they can find supports that give them more agency, more choice, even more sort of personal um, some opportunity where they can gain some control back in their lives. And that's what we really see um, I think happening in, in our downtown 
east side, but across the city entirely. So space, I would love to say that coming out of this conversation with Mayor Sim and our entire counselors uh, around the table here that we look to see how we can elevate this program so we don't do the 60%, that we can take it all the way to 100% and make sure that we're uh, meeting the, the broader need, which is to give people a place to land that they can get the supports and come back to so it can really make the biggest difference to them in their long-term recovery. So I'll leave it there. Thank you very much for the time, and thanks again for everyone for their work on this. Thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Carr. Yeah, thanks, Mayor. Um, first of all, I just want to acknowledge, I mean, we are all aware that this is an escalating crisis, um, and it's not just a mental health crisis. I mean, the toxic drug situation has exacerbated it phenomenally. Um, uh, I, I just want to say that the, the responses, the, the, the way we come about um, creating solutions is difficult. I mean, there's so many different angles that, that have to be taken on this. And I think that um, uh, the approach taken in this report is a good one. It's, a, it's not the only one. And much more needs to be done, but it's a good one. Um, in terms of much more needing to be done, uh, you know, I uh, I was working. Uh, we had a store in in Gastown when um, Riverview was deinstitutionalized. There was a dramatic overnight change in Gastown with people ending up on the street with their families couldn't take care of them, and that's that's where they ended up. Um, I, I do think the conversation is starting to happen around how does how do we support long term uh, support um, and care. Uh, for people. There was a great article actually in the, the Vancouver Sun um, around this uh, just this weekend. Um, I want to really thank the mayor and the councillors that put forward uh, this uh, this motion and the amendments um, that, that were made at the council table um, for wanting to take on this. It, it's not a traditional responsibility of the city, but you all recognize that it is our jurisdiction because it's the people that live in this city that are suffering. And uh, our role needs to be to try and solve it, obviously in partnership. Um, but as I say, thank you for uh, for that initiative. I want to thank the, the, uh, our staff and, and uh, Vancouver Coastal Health for, I think, a really a solid, good response that's feasible. I mean, we, you know, with... It's not just a matter of resources. It's, it's the, the, how many nurses are there out there? How many healthcare professionals of various backgrounds are there to be able to apply to this. So it's something I realize is going to have to be ramped up over time. And I really want to thank the provincial government for investing in response to this, in investing or putting forward some, some extra money now. And I think they recognize it's got to be a lot more over time too. Uh, and we're not the only city uh, that is coping with this. So um, that's it for me. Thanks. You. Happy to support. Thank you, Councillor Carr. Councillor Dominato. Uh, thanks, Mayor. And um, I will echo the thanks that's been offered by my colleagues um, to our staff, to the partners who are here with Vancouver Coastal Health and, and VPD, as well as uh, the provincial government in, in supporting these efforts. Um, a couple of additional reflections to those already made by my colleagues. It, it's become clear, and in in not just in recent months, in the last year, but I think when many of us were first elected in 2018 about what a profound need there was in the city and, um, and that fundamentally we had a health need in our city and, and the healthy city strategy was referenced, but um, I know from my perspective uh, at the outset, I've always believed that we needed a broader health response. I, I was reflecting back to, a, at the time, a contentious motion um, because we were grappling with uh, the Oppenheimer encampments and then later the, the Strathcona encampments how pronounced that need became in those contexts. And we, I know former Councillor Weeb and I brought a motion trying to look at how could the CAR 8788 model be expanded, but also calling for additional wraparound services. And that's why I'm really pleased by the framework that Vancouver Coastal Health has presented because it, 
It addresses a number of those issues that were identified a number of years ago, um, including, um, as Dr. Daly referenced, you know, the doubling of CARDI 788, but also um, if you look at the sheer number of FTEs going towards the de-escalation teams, again, this was another area that we heard very clearly that um, the public wanted to see, but also other professionals in this field were saying is that we need a continuum of service response. There are going to be times um, when we need a higher order of response, but um, uh, other times when we need teams in there who can help de-escalate and, and we, as, as, as was noted, um, a number of us met with the Canadian Mental Health Association over a number of years looking at the PACT model um, because of, there's an opportunity here um, to provide a, a range of services and response that meet the needs of residents who are really clearly in distress. And, and that's what I heard time and time again was I heard the public expressing concern and compassion um, and that they didn't know how to help. They, they were, some, you know, they didn't know who to call in many cases as been referred to. Um, and so this is a really important um, step forward. And what I also heard through um, all the discourse that we had with residents, with organizations, with BIAs, with community, was the importance of collaboration and partnership. And that's certainly reflected in the proposal that's been brought forward by Vancouver Coastal Health um, to the city, is the importance of working in partnership. And, and it's been alluded to is that, um, that Typically, this isn't seen as an area that is um, a city's jurisdiction, and certainly health still resides as a, you know provincial jurisdiction as well as partly federal. Um, however, the lines are increasingly getting blurred, and I think there is a bigger conversation that needs to happen provincially and nationally around how urban cities like Vancouver, like Montreal, like Toronto, as, as Councillor Bly noted, are supported in dealing with these issues um, because they are complex, um, they're nuanced, uh, and at the end of the day, we simply want to support um, these individuals who are struggling because, in fact, they're members of our families, they're our friends, they're people we know. And so for all these reasons, um, I'm incredibly grateful uh, for uh, the work to bring this framework forward to council, to the support of my co council colleagues, um, because there's urgency. And I think we've known that for some time, but we're, we're seeing uh, an initiative here that uh, I think holds great hope. Um, and I appreciate the evaluation component of it because then we will get a sense of, is it meeting the needs? Is it serving the uh, intended goals and outcomes? And so I simply will say, is, is, again, thank you. I think this is much needed. There's urgency and uh, very appreciative of, of all the effort uh, that has gone into bringing this forward to Vancouver. Thank you very much, uh, Councillor Clausen. Thank you, Mayor, uh, and uh, thanks to my colleagues. Uh, I'm hearing a lot of uh, recurring themes here, uh, Councillor Carr and Constant Dominato, really talking about areas of jurisdiction. Um, you know, I think it's really fair to say that through a whole range of measures and investments and infrastructure, the cities have an extraordinarily vital role uh, to play in supporting and enhancing the health of uh, our communities and our citizens. And so even though this a particular investment has been framed as being unprecedented and, and unique. I think it actually furthers our the health and well-being of Vancouverites. And uh, while uh, we announced this original idea of uh, hiring 100 mental health nurses on the campaign trail, I think a lot of credit has to go to uh, both city staff uh, and um, uh, Vancouver Coastal Health for taking this idea, this 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 goal that um, that uh, voters responded to, and turning it into an, a very actionable uh, and and well-defined set of goals, teams, and and uh, hiring strategy that I think will lead to success. I'm hopeful that it will bring positive change. That we'll be able to look back in a year, year and a half time, and be able to take away. Way the, uh, the 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 outcomes of uh, the work that's being done here, and look back and say that this is a very good decision. Uh, and so, again, thanks to uh, the, uh, both the Minister of Health, uh, Minister of Mental Health and Addictions, uh, the Premier, and our, our uh, partners at Coastal Health, and our staff here in the City of Vancouver. I think we are on to uh, I think a really important uh, initiative that Vancouver is leading the way on. Thanks. Thank you very much, uh, Councillor Fry. Thanks, Mayor, and I see I'm 
last on the queue, so I won't keep us uh, too long. I, I do, uh, I really appreciate where this direction has landed since the uh, motion was first introduced in November, and I think it's reflective of a lot of the collaborative work of this council and really learning and, and, and listening to the experts. And so thank you to Coastal Health and, and our own staff for really kind of leaning in and, and giving this kind of a, an advanced direction and working with Vancouver Police Department. I know Fiona's here somewhere, yeah. And, and just working together on a, on a collaborative solution that recognizes um, that, yes, this is outside of our lane, uh, but not doing anything is not an option, and we do have a responsibility to the, the, the people of Vancouver. Um, I, I will, however, just put my UBCM hat on for a minute and reflect that this is a space where local governments have been struggling across our province. And a multi-million multi -million dollar investment in mental health is not necessarily an investment that other local governments like Victoria, like Prince George, like Terrace, uh, and others can afford to make. And um, I can tell you that, that this move has raised a few eyebrows with some of our colleagues in local governments across BC. And I just you know, want to reflect that, that this is great that we're doing this, but this is an important uh, initiative that the province has to take on as well. And this can't be uh, just the, the local governments that can afford the resources to do this kind of work. It's clear that, that and, I, and I hope that this sort of pilot work that we're doing here will set a, a tone and a stage for the province uh, to really meaningfully in, invest in, in, in uh, alternate uh, uh, interventions for folks who are really struggling with, with mental health uh, and addictions and crisis intervention and de-escalation. And I'm, and I'm really hopeful around this kind of new direction is that we're taking with de-escalation and crisis intervention because I think that we've seen the evidence from other jurisdictions that that's the way to go. Um, and I really want to see us uh, move forward on, on some of the sort of crisis respite centers that we've talked about and making spaces available for folks because I think that's the missing piece here and we've talked about it today. And I think um, moving forward, that's gonna be a critical intervention. But on the whole, I think this is good for Vancouver. Um, and uh, th thanks to everybody who participated in putting this all together, so. Great. Thank you very much. Okay, um, a reminder that any council member joining Drew, everyone's here, so I can skip that, can't I? Um, okay, so uh, we're gonna put it to a vote. Okay, uh, the motion passes unanimously. It's a pretty big day here today. Uh, this is awesome. Thank you very much. And congratulations, everyone. Okay. All right, we're just going to take a three minute break if that's okay.
update. Where are we here? And by the way, thank you very much for letting us uh, go through that motion before the presentation. We have Andrea Law, General Manager, Development, Building, and Licensing here to provide opening remarks. Uh, really excited to be here today uh, to present an update on the permitting and licensing program. Um, in addition, uh, we have Teresa O'Donnell, uh, who will be here to update on the rezoning process as well. So before I begin, I just want to really thank the, the effort from many teams across the organization, DBL, uh, Engineering, and PDS, for contributing to the immense amount of work um, that we're going to share with you today. So the objective of today's presentation is to update Council on the various work components underway uh, to improve permitting, licensing, as well as our rezoning process. For discussion today, we'll provide a brief overview um, of our permitting and licensing program, some of the challenges and opportunities, uh, some of the key initiatives that have recently been completed. We'll share our work plan uh, for 2023, and then I'll turn it over to Teresa to provide an update on uh, metrics and trends uh, for rezoning. So permitting and licensing overview. Uh, why do we issue permits and licenses? Uh, we want to ensure uh, buildings are safe, accessible, sustainable, and meet various public uh, policy objectives through building development and commercial activities. As Council is aware, the City relies on permits and licenses to implement, implement a range of important policy objectives. However, over time, the complexity of the policy framework that has been developed has increased greatly, and the effort and time associated uh, with administering it. So this is the fundamental challenge uh, that is being addressed through this program. So I'm going to touch briefly uh, on the end-to-end -end process uh, of development in Vancouver. So the approval to construct a new building, uh, depending on the scope of the building, can vary and can include many permits uh, and steps along the way. An applicant may or may not go through all of the above steps or a subset of the steps, depending on the uh, project complexity. So this high-level overview uh, starts at the rezoning process, um, the handoff to development permit, uh, then to building permit, and ultimately to occupancy and business license. What we've tried to do over the years is condense this program as much as possible. We continue to look for opportunities to overlap our processes, uh, and this is ongoing work um, that has been happening for many, many years. This is a high-level view of the permits and licenses that we issue in the City of Vancouver. As you can see, uh, business licenses, building permits, development permits, uh, trades permits, and others uh, are all uh, part of our work program. We're looking today to focus on the scope around business licenses, building permits, development, and trades. So development permits versus building permits, what is the different, uh, difference? At a very high level, a uh, development um, permit allows for the uh, permission to develop the land according to land use approval and policy. And the building permit uh, grants permission to build or renovate a building under the pres prescribed bylaw and in compliance with the approval that's given through land use. Application streams. So we have multiple permit application streams that are tailored to project type. Over the years, uh, we've created more and more uh, project streams out of necessity, uh, coming from uh, council policy, uh, processes, new regulations. So over time, uh, these have become more and more layered and more and more complex. Uh, so we've tried to create buckets of similar types of applications um, that we can manage more appropriately, um, setting up processing timelines associated to those application streams. So uh, over the years, um, I can recall a time when we had uh, two development permit streams, one for majors, one for non-majors. Uh, now we have up to five development permit streams, again, to cater to the different types um, of development that we're seeing in the city of Vancouver. 
So as you can see, um, with the multiplex regulations that are coming before council, we've, we are now creating a separate stream to address those types of projects. We also have a new uh, program called Director Inspections, which I'll talk about a little bit later. So as we, as we evolve um, as a department and organization, we, we are required to create uh, new permit streams to address the workflow and the project scope. Uh, so just briefly on our licensing streams, uh, city administers over 600 different types of business licenses, everything from a general retail business opening up to short-term rentals, vehicle for hire, uh, liquor and cannabis as some examples. Uh, many of the licenses we issue have provincial uh, regulatory oversight as well, so we are required uh, to get reviews through the province uh, to get compliance and, and actually ultimately issue some of these licenses. This is a high-level overview of the uh, City of Vancouver's business license process. So uh, it's very uh, simplified. Uh, several activities can take place in each of these steps. But essentially, we have a simple and a complex uh, process streams when it comes to business licenses. 90% uh, of the business licenses that we issue on an annual basis uh, fall into the simple category and then 10% uh, fall into a more complex category. These can involve, as I mentioned, uh, coastal health, uh, Vancouver uh, police, zoning and building reviews, plumbing, electrical, uh, and other trades. So these, uh, so an, an example of that would be somebody coming in to apply for a restaurant. Uh, the space was previously approved as retail. So we know that there's going to be implications for coastal health. We know there's going to be implications under zoning and building. So those types of processes can take longer. Um, and those are the ones that typically um, may get escalated to council if, if um, business operators weren't aware of the changes or the necessary requirements um, to get a business license issued. So it can be fairly complex. So I'm just going to touch on some of the challenges and opportunities. As I noted, layers of complexity have impeded the city's ability to issue permits, uh, resulting in excessive review times for projects, increased costs, slow pace of development, which you're hearing about, uh, competing regulations and priorities, uh, frustrated applicants, as well as staff. So we've acknowledged that a transformative approach um, with radical change is required to improve the system, um, and that's the challenge that we're working through now. So factors complete, uh, creating complexity for permitting and licensing. Uh, you may have heard up to 45 re review groups for a development permit um, requiring input from various, or, uh, various departments across the organization as well as external parties. We have more than 650 policy documents governing development, which um, creates confusion not only for our applicants, but for staff who are managing the program. Uh, application quality uh, can substantially vary. We have very um, sort of sat what we would consider savvy applicants who have been working in the City of Vancouver for many, many years who have no problem navigating our programs and processes. And then we have applicants who are new to the city and may struggle to understand um, not only our regulatory framework, uh, but how we process our applications. So uh, application quality is something that we have um, addressed. It's not a unique to Vancouver problem. Many other municipalities uh, that we've been uh, communicating with over the past uh, 18 months are struggling with the same problem. Variability uh, in number of permits per year. So we try and stay ahead of this uh, with our external partners and looking ahead as much as we can at what's happening in the economy to, to judge uh, what we're, if we're going to see permit volumes um, increase. We also have uh, issues with staff. Unfortunately, we don't have a scalable workforce. We do have to bring in staff and train them for a period of time, especially our technical staff responsible for reviewing permit applications. So in the absence of a scalable workforce, we try and do what we can um, to keep our timelines and keep our, our, our processing times uh, aligned to, adjust, to um, address the volumes. It, it can be challenging, though. Uh, applicant turnaround time substantially varies. So again, uh, with our, our, our regular customers, uh, they're very good at meeting our timelines in terms of responsiveness. This is the chess clock analogy uh, that you've heard us refer to uh, before. Uh, we rely significantly on our applicants um, to meet our timelines as well in order to get permits out the door. And then finally, project scope. Uh, this varies substantially, even within a permit type. 
so low density housing is probably one of our more complex um, processes, especially around renovations when you're dealing with um, existing aging infrastructure. So it, again, it's not a simplified stream. We can't always necessarily provide a specific timeline given on the complexity of a scope of a project. I wanted to touch on, on this process again. This represents the end-to-end -end, um, process for a new single-family dwelling in Vancouver. This used to be once, once in one of our more simplified streams, um, a process that we could typically issue in a week. Over, over time, it's become more and more complex for a number of reasons. Uh, so this is something we've been focusing on through uh, the task force work is to really drill down on the, on the work that we can control in terms of our reviews. So uh, many of you have heard that we have reduced uh, the actual review time from uh, 12 weeks down to uh, 18 days. So the yellow boxes that you see here represent uh, staff or customer time, and the white boxes represent uh, staff time. So the salvage and abatement process, um, tree barriers, green demolition, these are all really great council policies that have been adopted um, over the years. These are the processes that can contribute greatly uh, to the timeline, um, especially with things like green demolition. Uh, the applicant has to demonstrate that they are diverting uh, the demolition material from the landfill. They require um, a certifier or professional uh, to oversee that work. There's only a certain number of professionals available um, to do this work, so that can really um, delay the processing time as well. Uh, if, a, if a home has a rental tenant in it right away, uh, from the time we issue the first building permit, which is the salvage and abatement permit, um, we have to wait four months uh, before, through the Residential Tenancy Act um, before we can move to the next phase of that uh, process. So it just really highlights some of the great policy uh, that has been added over the years, but how it contributes to the end-to-end -end process. Um, and what you can see at the bottom is roughly eight months. So through the, uh, through the work that we've done through the task force, uh, we've been engaging um, with uh, industry, really getting a sense of what applicants want. Um, I think that's pretty clear, predictable, transparent uh, processes, simple, minimal layers of regulation and policy, right-sized efforts to the work that they're doing, more risk-based approach, more, engaged, more, um, more reliance on industry, uh, responsive and customer-centric um, customer experience, and as well, fast and efficient, which we hear a lot. Uh, so some of the systemic opportunities to create our transformational change process. So we're working um, on multiple processing streams to eliminate unnecessary, unnecessary steps where we can. We're also leveraging technology to address um, much of this work wherever we can, simplifying, clarifying existing policies. This is being done through our regulation review um, that's being uh, led through uh, Teresa's team. Uh, governance, uh, we're trying to ensure issues are escalated uh, quickly to make a decision throughout this process as it can become very, um, it can be very, can very confusing for staff. They have getting multiple direction uh, from departments. Uh, quality of applications, you've heard me speak about that collaboratively, uh, working with our applicants and also shifting the internal culture uh, to be more uh, customer centric. Some of the key um, improvements recently delivered. Um, so just touching a bit on the permitting and licensing task force, uh, which we uh, originated about 18 months ago, closer to, yeah, 18 months ago. Uh, this was focused on small, uh, small high volume applications, uh, more quick wins, pilot projects that we introduced. It really garnered significant improvements, mostly for our small scale projects. We've now shifted over to the Permitting Improvement Program. This is a cross-departmental system-wide approach to transforming permitting and licensing. The changes uh, that we will identify through this program will take longer, but will yield uh, systemic improvements. I'm going to walk through some of the key accomplishments over the past 18 months that you, some of you may or may not be aware of. So we reduced uh, time to plan check low density housing projects from 12 weeks to 18 days. Uh, we reduced our business license wait times um, by 88% uh, down to two weeks. We created a new direct to inspections permit program. This program um, 
allows for us to process simple renovations, um, reducing our time from eight weeks to one week. And I can go into more detail about that um, a little bit later in the presentation. E-plan, uh, we implemented electronic plan review across all permitting types, uh, saving roughly our applicants a million dollars a year in printing costs. Our limited out-of-scope reviews, we've talked a bit about that, but really focusing on um, the scope of work and, and not really focusing on the unpermitted work that um, inspectors were finding uh, doing, uh, doing their inspections work. And then landscape review, we have now embedded um, uh, landscape staff into DBL to expedite reviews specifically relating to low density housing. We've introduced more transparency into our process um, with our um, open data, which is now available at vancouver.ca. We introduced a standalone laneway program, uh, creating a dedicated laneway stream, which has reduced our plan checking time from 28 weeks uh, to two weeks. We reinstated our TIPS program. Um, for those of you who may not be aware of our TIPS program, it's a tenant improvement uh, processing stream. Uh, this, this processing stream is targeted to code compliant buildings, mostly office towers in the downtown core. Uh, and we can now process those permits in anywhere from one to two weeks. Uh, which is a 50% reduction uh, in previous processing times. Change of use relaxation. So this relates to both permitting and our licensing stream. Um, this is exempting certain types of businesses uh, from permits. So this is our office uses and, and retail uses, saving up to 12 weeks um, for businesses to get a business license. We've also moved to an appointment system in our services center uh, coming out of COVID. This offers applicants an opportunity to meet directly with staff uh, to expedite resolutions. We're also digitizing our building permit drawings, uh, which have been on microfiche um, for many, many years. And this is gonna provide a, a much better service for public to access, uh, have access to building permit drawings. I'm gonna to quickly touch on the deliverables for 2023. Uh, there's a lot of detail in these slides, so I'm going to run through them very quickly. Uh, so we're focusing on most of the low-density housing work was done through uh, the task force. We still have some additional work to do there. We're focusing more on larger developments uh, in 2023, um, ramping up um, more changes to our business license program, focusing now on renovation center work and risk-based reviews in that area. Also, customer service will remain a topic of, of <laughs> consideration for the team and also looking at our financial st and stability, sustainability. So the work plan around low density housing, as I mentioned, we did a lot of this through the task force. Um, we're now going to be looking at um, the multiplex work, uh, simplified regulations for low density housing to speed up housing and enable multiplex buildings. We will be looking at the tree bylaw uh, in Teresa's team, uh, simplifying requirements for tree protection, removal, replacement, and reduced processing times. We're also refining application requirements. Uh, higher quality applications will result, result in uh, less review time uh, for staff and for customers. And we'll also be focusing on our digital application processing. So many of you saw uh, the Archistar demo that we provided in the council briefing. Uh, this will allow applicants to submit plans and have them digitally reviewed in real time. This will reduce errors and staff time. Uh, we're in uh, procurement right now um, with that platform. So we will uh, be providing council with an update on that at our next uh, date. Uh, rationalizing the work around large development is focusing right now on rationalizing development permit conditions. Uh, so um, this is a significant amount of work cross-departmental to look at how we can significantly reduce review times and iterations for our development permit process. Uh, the work for 2023 will be to create a standard conditions library. Um, we want to look at continuous improvement of the development permit process, including resolution of conflicting conditions. With large developments, we'll also be looking at optimizing uh, legal agreements. Um, the outcome here is to reduce times to finalize legal agreements between the city and applicants. Uh, this work will be starting, uh, I believe, in April, and we'll be reporting back uh, to council. In our business license area, the initiative um, will be to focus on the review of the vehicle for hire and license bylaw. 
We're looking to simplify and modernize uh, regulations, license categories, enabling further digitization of our business license program. We'll be coming to council in Q2. Uh, we're also excited to be launching our digital license application platform. Um, this will allow customers to submit applications digitally, of course, eliminate data entry uh, for staff, which takes up an enormous amount of time. Uh, we're launching this for home-based businesses uh, next week, so very excited about that. We're also expanding our change of use uh, relaxations. So again, this is in the license area, so we'll be looking at what low-risk businesses uh, will not require a development permit for change of use, and we'll be coming uh, to Council with recommendations uh, in Q4 of this year. Around the renovation work, I mentioned we had some great success in low-density housing uh, with our risk-based review approach to how we review plans. We'll be expanding this uh, into our renovation center to reduce the number of review elements to expedite reviews. We found that in our low-density housing area, we were looking at, staff were looking at 90 different items uh, as part of a plan review, and we actually reduced that down to less than 20. Uh, expanding the direct to inspections permits. So this is um, a process that we are very excited to roll out. Uh, applications for small scope renovations, whether it's a single family dwelling or a apartment or a condo, um, can expect to receive an app or a permit in one week. Uh, we've identified there's an opportunity through uh, how an applicant actually pays a fee and um, uh, follows up on an inspection, we can actually probably reduce that timeline down to roughly 48 hours. So we'll be reporting back on that um, and possibly expanding that program uh, in Q3. Uh, so I talked a bit about the te tenant improvement program, the TIPS program. Um, over the years, a lot of the TIPS eligible buildings have fallen off the register due to co code cycles. Um, so we're looking at a way to find a path forward to introduce these buildings back onto the TIPS inventory, uh, what upgrades might be required to the buildings to help them become um, as competitive as possible in the downtown core with other newer office buildings. And finally, customer service. Uh, we talked a bit about the Development and Building Services Centre, really looking at creating an applicant-centric uh, service centre experience down there. Um, so we're looking at both physical and digital uh, opportunities. Uh, we're also developing an advanced appointment booking system uh, and we will be uh, reporting back on that with our updates. Uh, and then finally, advancing permitting and licensing analytics. I know there's an extreme interest in, in providing data and how we're doing. So this is looking at improving insights on permitting performance, allowing applicants to forecast expected wait times based on their specific project scope. So this is focusing right now on um, opportunities to understand uh, the staff areas that we can control in terms of processing times. Um, so we'll be reporting back uh, in June on that one. And then just to finally to give you an update on our uh, intended report backs, we will be providing council with a update on in June of 2023. Um, this will look at targets and desired outcomes for development permits. Uh, Preliminary findings from industry engagement, uh, project summary, a uh, progress summary, and bringing forward any potential policy decisions for council. Uh, September 23, 2023, we'll look at comprehensive report back on the progress of all work streams with their achievements to date. And then in 20, uh, December, we'll be presenting the tree bylaw and report and progress update on improving metrics. And I will turn it over now to Teresa O'Donnell, who will provide an overview of metrics and trends for rezonings. Sorry, if um, I, I need a motion to extend past noon to finish the presentation from uh, team members, uh, and then we'll come back at 3 p.m. to ask questions of team members. So moved. Uh, Councillor Bly seconded by uh, Councillor Carr. Uh, all in favor say yay. Just all nice. opposed say nay. The motion carries. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you, Mayor, and I will be quick. Um, I did want to spend just a few minutes with you this morning to alert you to some trends that we're seeing in the rezoning group. Like Andrea's group, we're very data-driven. We collect a lot of metrics, KPIs. We watch them very, very closely. The last couple of months, we've seen some sharp increases in our volumes, particularly in the rezoning division. 
And I know you're starting to hear about those anecdotally, right? Um, they are impacting our performance measures, so I just want to give you a quick look at some of the data, and then we'll be reporting back. So this isn't a comprehensive review like um, Andrea gave on um, the program we've been working on jointly, but it's just to raise your awareness and alert you that we see a problem coming and, and that we're taking action to move uh, on it. So this shows, this pie chart shows um, the number of cases that staff are handling right now. These are the January numbers. We've had 296 active cases. That's about 100 more than what we usually do. So we've gotten a, a significant um, amount. If you'll, the color on here is a little faded, but the green cases in the different shades of green represent pre-application. Those aren't zoning applications. They're letters of inquiry. They're pre-advice. So, so about two-thirds of the work that we're experiencing right now is kind of pre-application. So this volume will continue to move its way along the path. And about a third of the, um, the, the blue items you see are, are actual zoning applications. So this is the count, right? We've got and, and what you'll see is an extraordinary leap in the letters of inquiry. And those really came out right after Broadway. So you'll see that these uh, numbers starting to move up. We also take these numbers and we break them down by classification, the, the, the type of case and the use. So again, you'll see that um, over, over half of these, 217, are actually major CD1 projects. So their strata, their office, their social housing, their high profile cases. We know those cases take longer, they're more complicated. We work with additional departments and divisions to process those. So a high number of very complicated cases are coming towards um, through the zoning stream right now. So this, um, this performance measure really looks at our volume in relation to our processing times. This is the letter of inquiries, and you can see that for, for the past four years, five years, we've been hitting our targets at between 14 and 12 weeks as a response for a letter of inquiry. But you can see this high number. You can he see this high spike. Uh, and so what this tells us, what this tells me, is we will not be, <laughs> with 120 LOEs in the system right now, we will not be meeting that 12 to 16 week time frame. And we're starting to hear that frustration from our applicants. But this is why. This is a big spike in work volume. So you can see we're watching these measures very closely. This, again, is the number of zoning applications we typically receive in a year. So we get 65, 70. You can see that 2022 was a spike. Because that was an election year, we only had... Um, we didn't have public hearings in four during four months. So we started this year with a bit of a backlog. So again, we're receiving a high number of cases and we started off with a backlog, right? So one of the things that we'll be doing is coming to council and asking about how we can move more of these cases through the system this year. Um, again, even though we only process only cases for seven months, we still pushed 63 cases through the council last year. The council worked very, very hard. We added a lot of meetings. We have a number of very contentious cases. A lot of work was done, but we, we started the year with a backlog, regardless, even, even though we pushed all this stuff through the system. Again, like our LOEs, for the past several years, our um, our applicants have expected, our service level expectation is to move the major public hearings through in about a year and the minor ones within um, six to eight months. That's the level of service the development community expects from the zoning team. That's not what we'll be able to do over the next six or eight months because of this backlog. You're, you'll be hearing from our applicants. We're hearing from our applicants. We're working on this. We're watching these metrics very, very closely. But you will see that our service levels will be slipping. So the big question, of course, is, Teresa, what are you doing about this? <laughs> are you watching it? Are you paying attention? And yes, we are. We've made, with Andrea reported on a lot of the work that we've already done through 
creating new processes and new procedures, doing a lot of process mapping, documenting our procedures, updating all our applications, and, and particularly doing all this monitoring and tracking of the data so that we know what's coming. Um, but that's not gonna be enough to handle this spike. We're watching these trends very closely to identify the drivers and the indicators, to understand if this is a prolonged increase or if it's a sudden spike that we just have to move through. Uh, so we know there, and we know a number of things. We know there was a lot of inquiries from Broadway Plan. We know we had a backlog from the last year. We also know that the economic uncertainty in the development industry right now is creating a lot of, of uncertainty. And applicants are coming in. You saw two-thirds of our work is just pre-application advice. People are wanting to come in, reposition their assets change applications that they've already had in the system, that's creating, a lot of, um, that's creating a lot of work. We know the impact. We know the staff resources right now are not adequate to meet the demand. We know our response times are, are slower. We're getting extenu extenuating uh, processing times, a lot of frustration because our, our applicants have been used to receiving a very high responsive level from the zoning division, and we're not able to meet those demands right now. It's also having an impact on our staff. Um, and so we are looking um, to make some short-term improvements. We're trying to improve our communication with applicants. We continue to look for ap operational efficiencies in a number of different ways. We will be coming back to the council to talk about how we can move more of these cases through the council, either by adding dates, adding the number of cases, increasing the efficiency in the public hearings. And long term, we know we've got some bylaw changes and charter changes and the e-plan implementation that's going to help. So this today was just kind of a warning signal to tell you that we have a problem. Houston, there is a problem. We are working to address it. Uh, we will be reporting back to you in the very near future to talk about prioritizing some different types of applications. Uh, we're talking with finance and the city manager's office about increasing some temporary staffing so we can bridge this backlog. And we also want to assess the impact of this volume on our other departments, particularly clerks, law, engineering, and DBL. So with that, um, I think that wraps it up for me. That's great. Thank you. That's that's great. Thank you very much. Uh, you do have questions. Um, so, oh, we're going to do questions afterwards. Sorry. Okay, you're going to have to come back. I'm so sorry about that. Um, so we're going to break. We're going to break for lunch. Um, uh, in camera, council starts at one, and we'll be back at three with questions.
Hi, Bonnie. Can you hear me? Hey, Kirsty. I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Thank you. Perfect. Good luck. Thanks.
back. Thank you uh, for waiting for us. So we uh, are on the permitting uh, presentation and council, you have up to five minutes to ask questions of team members. Are there any questions? And yes, there are. Councillor Meisner. Thank you, Mayor. Um, yes, I uh, had a few questions uh, on permitting, um, uh, probably for Andrea. So um, I've heard from a uh, few builders that uh, they really miss the in-person counter that we used to have and also the inquiry line. So just wondering uh, what the plans are uh, around those two pieces. Are we going to bring them back? Yeah, thank you very much for the question. Yeah, we are uh, looking at, uh, we did some engagement um, through COVID and after COVID um, with industry to just get a sense of how they would like us to utilize that space. And, and we did get a lot of feedback that people do, in fact, miss that in-person opportunity. Uh, we know that... Um, a lot of our customers have struggled with our online uh, application process. Uh, it is We are finessing it as we go and, and lessons learned, um, but it's, it's obviously um, still presenting a challenge for a lot of our customers. So we recognize that. We had to shift pretty quickly through COVID. So yeah, we will be looking at exploring uh, more opportunities for uh, in-person appointments. Okay, how about the inquiry line? So the... So like the, line, the phone line. Phone line. Yeah. So we still have the phone line that comes through three one one, and I believe that gets directed to uh, internal staff still. So that that is still available. Okay, great. Um, so I understand staffing is a challenge. Obviously, mm -hmm. I saw there's you know quite a bit of turnover, and I'm sure it's hard to find people with the right expertise. Um, but I'm just wondering if there's been any consideration to um, perhaps increasing fees to pay for more staff or faster processing. I've heard from, again, lots of builders that they'd be happy to pay more if they knew that their permit would be processed quicker. Yeah. Thanks for the question. So yeah, staffing is definitely a challenge. Um, we're dealing with probably the most significant number of uh, vacancies that I've seen in my term with the city. Uh, so our priority right now is to staff up uh, as soon as we can. I think we're we're comfortable that with the with the advocacy of technology um, that we're using and getting our staff numbers up that we uh, can manage the timelines. So between those two um, objectives, uh, we're hoping to bring timelines uh, back down into uh, sort of more acceptable uh, processing timelines. But yeah, it's it's a challenge. We've been out to BCIT advocating. Uh, we got a lot of positive feedback from people out there looking to work at the city of Vancouver, so we're encouraged by that. But I would say staffing is our probably our number one challenge right now. Okay. Um, I have, my other questions are uh, for Teresa, so thanks, Wait. Andrea. <clears throat> Hi, Teresa. Hi. Um, so when we're getting rezoning uh, applications, are we... Um, providing the re like estimated reply time for saying LOR to applicants. Do they have any idea how long it's gonna how long it's gonna take for them to hear back? Because I hear from again a lot of applicants that are like, you know, I sent in this rezoning, I have no clue what's going on. Right. Um, we do. Now, let me just say on LORs, we have always posted our response time and we always give a response time. But last month, we took that response time down off our webpage because we knew we weren't going to be able to meet it uh, because of that huge spike that we had on Broadway. Um, I was meeting with the team during lunch, and I think we're going to clear mo most of those LORs are going to start going out in batches uh, in the next couple of weeks. So we'll make significant progress on that. But typically, our response time is 12 to 16 weeks, and we've been meeting it until the Broadway kind of thing hit. Okay, and we're going to put that back online once we get through this backlog? Yes. Okay, that's great. Uh, and then my other question was, uh, maybe just because I don't understand the whole process and the political implications, but what is the rationale for pausing public hearings for four months during the election, which has now resulted in a massive backlog? Well, that was not... That's a standard protocol, and I believe the council had changed their procedures right before the election, or maybe the year before the election, uh, to have that quiet period. I'm looking at the city manager for help. <laughs> but I think that's right. I think the council had actually changed their procedures so that they didn't hold that. Now, having said that, 
The council did work remarkably hard during last year, and we got a year's worth of cases. We just had such an extraordinarily high volume coming at the latter part of 22, and now we're anticipating about 40% of the LORs that we send for the Broadway plan to turn into applications. That's kind of a standard metric for us. Yeah. So yeah, sorry, sorry you're, for the delay. You're at time. Sorry, saved by the bell. <laughs> Sarah? Uh, Thank thank, you. Thanks, Mayor. Um, so question, I think I ask this question each time, and it's, it's a bit daunting when you hear the update as to how much work there is doing and how many regulations there are. I'm trying to get back to this line of sight for the public and for council around this report card kind of idea. We had motions previously around posting the current estimated wait times for permitting, for example, online are getting towards kind of a one pager with metrics and traffic lights. There's lots of slides and lots of data. And I know it's complex, but I'm still trying to wrap my head around it. If we're trying to look at in a simple, digestible way, how are we doing on some of these things, whether it's change of use simplification or it's the RS1 permit or a simple renovation or whichever it is. So are we working towards that? Because I know this has come up a few times. Yeah, thanks for the question. So um, a couple of things. Um, what we've been really digging into um, since we started producing the open data is what's within our control in terms of permitting. So what we can control is our timeline with respect to the various stages of the permit. What is outside of our control is customer time, uh, which I alluded to in a few of those slides there. So we're really focused on... Um, our timelines, um, our performance levels as against those timelines um, for each permit type. Um, and so short answer to the question, yes, we should have something for you in June when we report back next. And can that be posted online or updated on a regular basis? Like so the idea is, is that we would share that with, um, with mayor and council and also the city manager's office and then reach a decision as to how we want to share that information more broadly. Okay. Um, also, next question is that last term we had a motion on uh, directing uh, staff to look at the option for guaranteed permit wait times, and if we didn't meet them, uh, then your project's approved de facto, and then perhaps we did spot checks, for example, and looking at what that looked like. So where is that? So that's exactly what we've been doing in terms of uh, timelines, really focused in on what we can control um, in, in terms of our timelines. I think... Uh, we've also been engaging with other municipalities uh, to see how that's going. We know other people are experimenting with that as well. So we're taking lessons learned from that, but we are not in a position right now to, to present on guaranteed permitting timelines. It is, it is in, uh, opposed to our sort of our approach to customer service as well, because what we're finding is the criteria for a guaranteed permit timeline is a complete application, and that's where we're really struggling is getting complete applications in the door. What's the harm um, if the... If if the hurdle is a complete application, and let's assume that the criteria is your application has to be complete, and then we give you a guaranteed wait time, what's the downside to trialing something like that? Just Again, I think it's largely what's within our control and what's not within our control, which is the customer time. So it's really drilling down on what is what are we guaranteeing? Are we guaranteeing staff time in a process, or are we guaranteeing an end-to-end -end permitting timeline? And that's what we're working through right now. Okay. Uh, has our research shown other cities doing that? Uh, we're still working through uh, our conversations with other cities who are in the middle of it right now. I know Toronto recently was mandated to, um, to uh, a, a, approach uh, guaranteed permitting timelines, so we're working with them as well. Okay. Um, and then switching gears, another question. Uh, there's always lots of conversation around use of certified professionals um, mm -hmm. and uh, again, same sort of idea. If it's checked by a certified architect professional, it's their reputation and kind of on them if uh, they're not staying up to date on code and all the safety regulations. And then we just spot check on some of those. So are, are, have we increased our use of those? Uh, we, we do use certified professionals in terms of the permitting uh, approach. Uh, we are looking at this through our sprinkler program, which many of you may be aware of has presented challenges over the over the last few years. So we have been working with a consultant on that explicitly, how we can rely more on uh, industry experts and professionals to assume more of the responsibility in permitting. Um, interesting findings coming out of that is it's uh, sort of split half and half of those professionals that uh, want our oversight to a certain degree and others that don't. So we're working through that uh, sort of interesting feedback that we've received. 
Okay, uh, when might council expect to get something back on that? We know when we're gonna get something back on sprinklers. Uh, we can provide an update in June as to where we're at with the sprinkler piece of work, but it, we are working with a consultant right now. Yeah, sorry, just to clarify, um, I'm not, and you can follow up offline, so my time's running out, but not just for the sprinklers, but just in... Certified in professionals and, yeah, sure. Yeah, we can certainly provide an update on our progress to date. Okay, thank you. Great. And you're at time. Thank you. Um, Councillor Joe. Okay, thanks, Mayor. Yeah, also very similar to Councillor Kavion's question re regarding the dashboard. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think you're saying we're going to have some dashboard in June this year. So are we going to see some demo before that? So we see what we mean by that dashboard, what information is there? So, yeah, so the team has committed to providing uh, an update when we come back to council in June. Uh, so we will have to let you know in advance of whether we can provide you something in advance of that, um, of that timeline. Okay, so it's just an update to the council in June, not the actual dashboard. Uh, it is a dashboard, okay. uh, but we would want to share that with council and city manager's office before we uh, sort of produce that more publicly as to what this is what you're looking for. Okay. Yeah. Uh, the other question is, so I heard uh, also there's some, uh, we need more clarity and, and guidelines, you know, because a lot of uh, uh, applicants for the rezoning, they don't know the, all those guidelines, so they have to submit many times, which also increase your workload. Mm -hmm. So would, do, do we work on that as well to avoid some rework and reapplication? Is that the handoff from rezoning to permitting or, or just rezoning? Oh, the whole entire process. process. We heard there's a lack of uh, uh, clarities. So for the application, they don't even know what, you know, what, yeah. That's, that's one of the reasons that we um, ask applicants to go through the LOE process. They don't have to, but they can. But that's what we do. Remember yesterday when we were in there and I was showing you the maps with all the plans from 1974 in the 80s and 90s? During that LOE process is when we research all that for them. And then we provide them this lit, written letter of response that have gone through and done an exhaustive search to see which ones apply. And then we give them a written confirmation of that. So if they go through that process, they have the clarity. If they skip the process, they don't. And do we have any idea like uh, for the workload, how many of those applications, they are reapplication or rework? Because of lack of clarity. Do we know that? Um, what we know is that we get, um, we get duplicate, we get several inquiries on the same piece of property for different applications. So they'll send us one and they'll say, well, you know, the zoning allows 20 stories. Will you accept 30? And we say, eh, probably not 30. And they come back and they say, well, what about 25? And so it's a very iterative process. It goes back and forth. Uh, but that's at the applicant's choice. Okay, so one more question regarding the numbers. So I saw a lot of numbers here. So slide number uh, 36, I saw the, uh, the average wait time from 2018 to 2022. So, you know, what, uh, my question is, do we have a distribution of those uh, wait times? So the, the, why I'm asking these questions, I'm wondering if long waiters is the one driving the percentage average high or it is just across the board? Because, you know, average sometimes could be misleading, mathematically, right? Yes, yes. Average is misleading, yes. You're exactly right. So do we yes. have a, the, the problem for this issue is long waiters, or it is always 11.1 weeks across the board? That's my question. So should we put more resources to solve those long waiters so we can reduce the average dramatically? That's my... Yes, and what, what happened is we were hitting that. We were hitting that 11 weeks. We could add staff and um, shorten that. But we were maintaining those performance levels until we got this spike. So now there's 120 of those applications. Um, and what is, part of this is a fee review because we know we're undercharging for those. It's not a, an expensive ask. We, we dedicate a lot more staff resources than we actually charge in fees. So we need to, we need to work with budget and we need to right, right size those fees. Okay, so I guess my question is if we have a distribution instead of just an average, that would give us better understanding. We have a complete breakdown. We know of all those LOEs, when we, when we send the LOE, how long it takes them to get back to us, how many are repeats. What's, I can tell you that the average, after we issue an LOR, 
the average response back to staff with an application is between six months and two years. We track all that. Be happy to show you all those metrics in a more um, comprehensive briefing. I guess those will be included on the dashboard, right? So from one to one, how long is the wait time? Yes, and I look at those metrics. We have very exhaustive me metrics, particularly for zoning. I look at them once a month. When they scare me, I send them to the city manager. Uh, and we can review those with council, and you can start to see kind of what we're measuring and how we're measuring it, and we can break all that down for you, yes. Okay, so my last question is, since sorry, we have uh, all uh, those Councilor, data... Councillor Joe, you're oh, at time. Oh, sorry. sorry. Sorry about that. No worries. Um, Councillor Montague. Uh, thanks, Mayor. Uh, I think my questions are probably going to be for Teresa as well. Um, you, you did mention that uh, you've been hearing from applicants and that we've probably been hearing from applicants as well. Uh, to I say that is an yep. understatement is the yes. biggest, uh, is unbelievable. We hear a lot. Um, a lot of it has to do with one of the things you mentioned in, in the presentation about process improvements mm -hmm. and the PEP. Yes. Really, is, is the PEP working as staff has hoped it would work? Are there problems with it? What can be tweaked? Um, the feeling that I'm getting from the correspondence that I get is that it's not working, but... We think it's working. And it, but we would like an opportunity to review that with the council and talk about priorities and what the council's goals are. We, um, when we originally envisioned PEP, and I think Councillor Kirby Young said this recently, is that we envision that process for exceptional projects. And what we don't get a lot of exceptional projects. We get a lot of, I can't make my finances work, let me break the rules. Those are not exceptional projects, in our opinion. They're not meeting or exceeding the criteria that the past council set. And so we evaluate all of those by the council approved criteria. Understand that this council will want to review that and set their own criteria, and we are prepared to have that discussion with the council at your earliest convenience. Okay, yeah, I think I'd, I personally would love to see that yep. uh, for sure. Um, my other question is, um, you mentioned a, a big uptick with the Broadway plan with uh, inquiries. LO, uh, LOEs, LOEs, yeah. Uh -huh. uh, so how do we differentiate the tire kickers from serious applicants? Is there, are you, is there a process that you're using or? Yes, and you will get a briefing on the Broadway plan at the end of this month. And we'll start to kind of discuss that with you. And those, um, and what we're seeing, uh, we're clear, the, the good news is the vast majority of the applicants are complying with the plan. They, and so we think we're going to get a lot of good, strong applications. But there are clearly folks that are coming in early to test the policies of the plan that don't want to provide 20% affordable, that want to exceed the heights or the densities of the floor plates. Um, averages hide that, but we've, we know that those are outliers. Unfortunately, they're the early ones. So the, the plan will be tested early in its, uh, in its infancy to, to look at those. Now, the nice thing about all those, all those LOEs coming in at once, We've done a batch review on them. So we have got very good metrics. How many comply, where they comply, where they don't comply, what the outliers are. You'll see all that data in the Broadway briefing coming up on February 28th. Okay. And if it's one thing else I've heard from all these applicants and developers and builders is that, yes, the city keeps excellent metrics and data. So uh, We do. We are a data-driven department. Uh, yes. Thank you, Great. Thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Dominato. Uh, thank you. And, and thanks for the updates. Um, greatly appreciate it. Uh, there's been a, a great focus on this area. I have a couple of follow-up questions stemming from um, feedback we've had from builders, but also from uh, previous motions. One is uh, with respect to um, looking at um, addressing permits related to non-bricks-and-mortar endeavors in the city. And this goes back to a multitude of projects that came forward last term, particularly in the spring and summer months around activations. Some of them were around public activations on the waterfront to um, uh, bike shares in parkades, to food distribution in, um, in parking lots that were being underutilized. And 
I moved a motion at that time to see that we could find a better way forward around that. And I'm just curious, is that a part of the body of work that's going forward? Because it was an immense frustration for different organizations coming in the city wanting to do innovative things, but just didn't fit the current framework. And so is that a body of work that's coming back to council? Yes, yes, it will be coming back to council. Teresa and I have been talking about this um, even earlier today, just because it's uh, it's come up on our radar again. So I think we're working through um, how best to approach that, given that there's a lack of, of uh, specific land use policy around uh, that body of, of, or that business type of business. So yeah. Fantastic. Coming Yay. back. Okay, that's great. Um, my other question is, have you had um, positive response around, you had initiated some changes around uh, persons with disabilities who are doing, seeking retrofits and, and being prioritized in our system and recognized either their contractors or otherwise, just because in some cases they couldn't live in their homes. And yeah. is there been success with that? Or do, can I get a line of sight into how that's working? Because that was, again, another area of frustration. Um, yeah, I mean, we can certainly provide you an update on that, but it is an area that we have been focusing on for many years. So I think there, there was one instance where um, there was a, a miscommunication on the part of the applicant and the staff person involved. But yeah, we have always had a process where we prioritize that work, where applicants can self-identify with us early on so that we know. Um, and then we'll, you know, we put those projects definitely to the top of the pile to, to advocate for them wherever we can. Fantastic. Okay, yeah. that's great. Um, I want to follow up on just a couple other considerations. Um, one of the um, conversations that's come up with the past in terms of uh, all the different elements of work mm -hmm. is whether structurally um, we're set up for success in terms of having planning department, DBL, mm -hmm. and is there, as you're working through changes, is that a conversation that's taking place about how we're set up structurally across the organization? Because I know you referenced there's been great improvements around kind of cross-department mm -hmm. efforts and communication, um, but is that part of the work plan? We're not specifically looking at reorganizing. Um, I see the city and manager standing up, so I'll defer to, uh, to Paul. Thanks, and thanks for the question, Councillor. Yeah, at, at this point in time, we're, we're not looking at structure. Uh, I think that any type of, because we have rearranged structure at various points in the past. In fact, the creation of Andrea's role as a, as a GM focusing on this business was, was intended to get at this problem. Really where we started to encounter major problems with permit turnaround was the, uh, when we had a single GM that was responsible for planning and development services and buildings. And the scope of that role, particularly in Vancouver, with the demands on the planning director, is massive. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think what we found there is that the GM did not have the ability to deal with all the planning work and the process pieces. So I think right now there's there's lots of work we need to do. You know, in the future, um, would there potentially be a need to revisit structures? I would possibly. Uh, at this point in time, though, I think the focus is more on the process piece and then the surrounding mm -hmm. policy. Uh, and making sure that we are working across departments in a way that's effective. So it's not, as Andrew said, not kind of immediate on the work plan. Um, I think there are definitely some reorganizations that, you know, and Andrew spoke about it today in terms of um, assignment of uh, some um, landscape staff directly to mm -hmm. DBL. So at that level, we're looking at where work sits. Uh, but in terms of restructuring the GM portfolios with engineering as well, no. So hopefully that answers your question. Yeah, no, it does. That's great. Thank you. Um, I have two, a uh, couple more quick questions. Uh, one's around, you referenced the gap around um, application quality as well as turnaround time sometimes from the applicants. Um, what steps are we taking to help that along in that case? Because uh, is that, you've definitely identified that as being a gap. It's not always on the city side, but it may, is, what's happening in that vein? Is it more with individuals who That's aren't right. doing this very often? Councillor Dolman, out of your I'll time. Your I'll, I'll move for a second round. Thanks. Second round? Yes. Uh, second. All in favor? Great. Thank you very much. Um, Councillor Klassen. Thanks very much. Thanks very much, Mayor. Um, just a few areas. Uh, on CACs, um, how typically d could a CAC negotiation hold up a development process? And if the gap is reasonably narrow, say, a six-figure number uh, on a multi-million dollar project. Can we set aside that negotiation and get down to work? Thank you for the question. And um, yes, 
we can make it work. We are in the process of a CAC transformation project. Um, we are actually just about to launch today a uh, deal point to UDI for them to consider. We have timeframes in those in that in those deal points, and we're hoping to get to a point where we can actually consolidate some of the concerns that the industry has had on the CAC negotiation itself. Um, we're trying to narrow the timing for the development approvals, working with PDS, obviously. Um, but right now, I think that um, we're acutely aware that our ability to actually move projects when we're within a, a hair, right, is something that's a priority for us. The issue, uh, Council Klassen, is also the applicant. There are issues with applicants not giving us all of the required information for us sometimes to finish our negotiations. But again, that's not on us, that's on them, but we're working with them closely. But our, our, our goal right now in this transformation project is to actually move these projects faster and quicker. Thank you very much. You're welcome. We also keep metrics on that. And we know a standard negotiated CAC takes about three months, and, in, and that falls well within the one month, uh, the 12 month zoning review. So we do keep metrics on that. There are a few outliers, but for the most part, those are resolved well within that time frame. I'd like to focus the rest of my three minutes here on customer service. There's a, um, a, a goal here in one of the slides talking about culture, staff culture and customer service, I assume, at the desk, but in terms of dealing with it. Um, have we brought any outside uh, consultants to help us teach that those skills to our staff? Uh, at this time, we have not brought external consultants in. I think we're still working through what model we want to see uh, in the services center. We are exploring that uh, from a customer, very customer-centric um, approach. But yeah, to, we have not engaged any external experts. So, the, the, and I'm, I'm going to try and frame this very carefully, but there are uh, stories where, I mean, you, it, it, the culture of, of the development industry and the relationships with the city has always been a little fraught. Mm -hmm. um, but there's, um, the, the developers are usually, in many cases, very successful um, uh, and people w of means and uh, city staff have that, have to try and work with them. Uh, and so there's a tension there. Mm -hmm. Is there a way that we could um, kind of bridge those gaps a little bit so we do have a better working relationship, and I'm, I'm, I don't know, and I realize you were dealing with hundreds of different uh, stakeholders, mm -hmm. so, but it, 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 I, going back to that culture, uh, customer-centric culture, is there a way that we can improve that so people really are feeling good about the process, um, notwithstanding the tensions that come up with negotiations and so on? Yeah, and thank you for the question. And yes, we're very acutely aware of that. I think historically we were much better, uh, had much better relationships uh, with the development community. I think we really noticed a shift through COVID when our doors shut and the culture uh, that industry uh, perceived was one of a fortress. They couldn't get access to anybody. Uh, they couldn't meet with staff. It felt... Um, it felt like it was breaking down significantly. So yes, we're acutely aware of that and working on uh, all opportunities and any opportunities uh, to improve relationships uh, with our industry partners. And I'd certainly appreciate any kind of update on that customer service piece. Great. Final question. Um, we're all used to apps now that tell us when our orders mm -hmm. are arriving. Uh, you know, Jerry's got your skip the dishes order. He's two kilometers away. Are we ever going to be in a place where um, people who are doing business with the city will know, you know almost in real time where their projects are at? I think we will. I think we're looking at the very simple transactional processes now in order to, to deliver that information. I think it gets very complicated uh, when you're dealing with uh, processes that uh, are reviewed across multiple departments. Um, with their own uh, competing timelines uh, for other work. So it, it is a work in progress. It's something we're working towards, but we'll likely start with some smaller transactional quick wins uh, in that area. Thank you very much. Right on time. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Joe. Yeah, so I'm going to continue the question I didn't ask before. So uh, I don't want to jump too fast to the solution, but uh, this may, may sound very technical, but um, how we think about collaborating with some university, you know, because some of these issues are very typical uh, academic pro 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 questions, like using queuing theories, like using the uh, simulation model to simulate all this. And then, you know, have we think about that collaboration with acad acad academia? 
uh, in terms of um, metrics? How can we reduce the wait time? It's a very typical operations research or queuing theory problem. To date, we've really just been focusing on other municipalities and cities that are experiencing similar problems around permitting. So we have not gone, um, to my knowledge, we haven't gone uh, external beyond that. So um, I will be really keen to explore some opportunity of that because we have a lot of data. We can use this data for modeling, advanced analytics, and that would support our decision making in terms of re uh, wait time reduction. And that's what, what, what we did in the healthcare. Mm -hmm. So because of the data, because of the modeling. Yeah, so just my suggestion. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Councillor Dominato, were you looking to get on the queue again or? I'm, you know what, I'm going to pass in the interest okay, of time. Great. I just wanted to make sure we didn't um, uh, skip you. Okay. Um, well, thank you very much for the presentation. That was incredibly, uh, incredibly insightful. And thank you for all the hard work that you do, you're doing because I know it's a, it's a pretty big file and I know there's a lot of energy around it in the community. And the fact that, you know, times are uh, going down all across the board is, uh, it's great. So thank you. Um, all right, so we're going to head off uh, to the reports now. Um, uh, reports held for debate, questions to staff, or a separate vote. So the first uh, report held um, is report number five. And report number five is the quarterly capital budget adjustments and closeouts. And it was held by um, Councillor Meisner. Um, does any member uh, wish to declare a conflict of interest on this item? No? Great. Uh, Councillor Meisner, uh, you held this report. You have five minutes, up to five minutes, to ask questions uh, to the team. Thank you, Mayor. Um, it's just a fairly, hopefully, straightforward question. Um, I noticed when going through it uh, in detail, uh, the Coal Harbour School, I noticed that uh, the cost has gone up 10%. And I, I also live in the area, and, and I know this project's underway, that they've broken ground. So I'm just wondering how we can prevent these sort of cost escalations in the future. Do we have fixed term uh, like contracts, that sort of thing? Maybe just some information on that because it's 10% nice. of the overall budget. It's $3.3 million. And uh, the escalation, it is partly due to escalation and an increase of scope by the school board. It is the, the component of the $3.3 million is exactly towards the school uh, redevelopment. Uh, it's not, you know, REFM is is managing the project, but it is actually a, a facet. They are going to reimburse us 100% for the 3.3, so where it's a wash. It's got no cost to the city whatsoever. Okay, great to hear. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Is that it, Mr. Mayor? Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, seeing no other questions, would someone like to move a motion? Thank you, Councillor Boyle. Uh, seconded by Councillor uh, Klassen. Sorry, I saw him. He was very excited. Uh, council, is there any discussion? No? Okay. Let's see. Okay. I'm now going to call... Everyone's here, right? Okay, great. I'm going to, uh, now I'm going to call the vote. To clerk, can you please take us to the voting screen? Council, please register your vote on the voting panel. Oh. Sorry, yes? Okay, so we can do that verbally. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, well, that being said, the motion carries unanimously. Sorry, the ro report carries unanimously. Is that it? Well, it, it, it carried. So, um, <laughs> great. <laughs> All right. J jumping on, uh, moving along here. We're in the bylaws now. We have four bylaws on the agenda for an enactment. Uh, council members who were not present for the meetings related to public hearing um, enactment bylaws must confirm that they have reviewed the proceedings of the meetings if they wish to vote on the enactment. Bylaw number three is from public hearing of February the 9th, 2021. Councillors Klassen, Meisner, Montague, Joe, and myself were not on council at the time of the public hearing. However, on Janu January the 31st, 2023, Councillors Klassen, Meisner, Montague, and Joe advised that they had reviewed the proceedings related to bylaw number three and would therefore be voting on uh, enactment um, on the enactment. Um, I have not reviewed the document, so I will not be. Um, would someone like to move a motion uh, to adopt bylaws one through four? Councillor Joe, seconded by uh, Councillor Montague. Thank you. Councillor, uh, is there any discussion? No. All those in favor say yay. All those opposed say nay. 
Great. The motion carries unanimously. Uh, the list of appro approved bylaws can be found on the city's website. Okay, council member motions. We have four council member motions on the agenda today. Motion B1 is requests for leaves of absence as follows. Councillor Kirby Young for civic business on March the 28th, 2023 from 6 p.m. to 10 p.m. and April 26th, 2023 from 5 p.m. to 10 p.m. Councillor Boyle for personal reasons from April 4th to 6th, 2023 and May 15th through June 2nd, 2023. Councillor Klassen uh, for personal reasons from April the 6th, or sorry, April 3rd through the 6th, uh, 2023. Councillor Carr for civic business on March the 30th, 2023, from 6 p.m. to 10 p.m. Councillor Bly for civic business on February the 23rd, 2023, from 9.30 a.m. to 1 p.m. March 7th and March 8th, 2023, from 9.30 a.m. to 10 p.m. And March 9th, 2023, from 3 p.m. to 10 p.m. Is there a mover? Great. Councillor... Um, uh, seconded by Councillor uh, Carr, uh, moved by Councillor Bly. All those in favour say yay. All those opposed say nay. Great, the motion carries unanimously. Motion B2 is equity lens review of city bylaws to ensure equity is at the forefront and is to be moved and introduced by Councillor Joe. Councillor Joe, you have two minutes to introduce your motion. Thanks, Mayor. Okay, so I'm honored to enabling the motion of uh, the equity lines review of city bylaws to ensure equity is always at the forefront. Uh, this motion fulfills the commitment that we brought forward during our election on our uh, 94 point platform. Uh, city of Vancouver approved the uh, uh, equity framework in 2021. My appreciation to city staffs and the previous council in stepping forward uh, uh, to create a unified vision and shared understanding of equity across the city. Uh, from the first bylaw in the history of Vancouver, of Vancouver, which was in 1886, to when the equity framework was approved in 2021, during this 135 years history, there are approximately 10,000 bylaws or 200 consolidated bylaws in the city of Vancouver. Potentially, there might be some bylaws do not align with the city, uh, city's equity objectives and framework. Therefore, I think uh, those bylaws need to be updated. Uh, for example, I think in other cities, it is not un uncommon to see some bylaws with discriminatory languages and content, exclude certain group pe of people uh, applying jobs or practicing in certain professions. Uh, so there are two parts of this motion. First, from the historical, for the historical bylaws, uh, the motion directs staff to report back to council by Q3 this year with a high-level inventory by city bylaws that potentially requires amendments. In the first draft of our motion, actually, we, uh, we actually proposed Q2 in this, mo uh, I, 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 this year as the timeline. But after review, staff comes back with recommendations of moving the timeline to Q3 because of the complexity and the resource allocation. So really appreciate the feedback from the staff. And uh, we listened and accepted the feedback in this final motion, which you have seen in, your, uh, in front of you right now. The second part of this motion is about future stage, so that ensure all future bylaws align with our equity framework and revealed through the equity lines. So I think the motion itself is quite self-explanatory, so I'm open for a question and discussion. Great, thank you in your time. Uh, Council, are there any questions for Councillor Joe? You will have up to one minute to ask questions, and I see Councillor Boyle, you are up. Thanks. Uh, I just wanted to clarify because it's uh, important work. What uh, I know a lot of this is happening already under the equity framework. Um, what this motion directs that uh, your sense is wasn't already underway from staff. If any bylaws need to be up, uh, updated or amended. Okay. And do you have an understanding of what of that work staff were already doing through the equity framework that was passed? So we had a discussion with staff. I think uh, they came back seeing this, all this work is uh, doable. And they just want to move the timeline from Q2 to Q3, which we, li we listened and uh, accepted. I think uh, that's uh, what will be, they will be report back to the, uh, to the council. Okay. 
That's all. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much. Councillor Joe, you have the floor again. Is that right? Or Oh, no, that was uh, the previous one. All right. We will. Oops. Councillor Klassen, I just jumped the queue. There. You, you're up. Okay, thank you, uh, Chair. Uh, um, just wondering if a point, point of information of, as to whether uh, uh, Council would uh, consider or can consider um, a moving to debate and uh, waive the one speaker on the list and, um, uh, and, and, and complete the business on this motion. Um, Sorry, can I understand the question again? So do we have a speaker on this uh, issue and the court request is to waive the speaker and just debate it? Um, okay, I have to confer with the experts here. Awesome, and then the script is all different. I'll right. let them know. Just to, I mean, it's not every day that we just they don't it right now. So then, Nope. All right. This is going to be quite the adventure, let me tell you. So, uh, yes, Councillor Klassen, we can do that. So you move that. Uh, I would need a seconder um, if someone would like to second. So we need a seconder uh, for the motion that will actually let us skip the speaker and bring this right to the floor to uh, discussion and debate. Do we have a seconder? Second. All in favor say aye. Oh, no, no, we're, we're just passing the motion to, or, or so you guys want to have a discussion on whether or not we do this. Right. Uh, so, council, um, I guess, uh, is there, oh, there are a lot of people in the queue. Let's uh, have that conversation. So, do I, sorry, clerk, do I put that in the main queue? Or is this still a question queue? Sorry, can I please get everyone to Councillor Boyle? Thank you. I think I saw. Here we go. Okay, uh, so Councillor Boyle. Thanks. I just have a question through you to the mover of the motion, which is just to to understand. I don't know the speaker if there's been a, a conversation with the speaker that they can't speak or why. I think it's a, it's an unusual circumstance that we would do this, but not. Michael. Uh, truthfully, it's just in reflection of the, the amount of business that we have coming up tomorrow. Uh, I spoke to the mover. Apparently, uh, the speaker is familiar with him. He felt comfortable with it, and I just thought it would be a way for us to uh, get moved in. And certainly, we appreciate anybody who comes forward that, and we would obviously like to communicate with, with the speaker and make sure if they have any sort of follow-up um, uh, you know, ideas or expressions that they want to. But at this time, it's really just a, a way of us um, uh, keeping the business of, of council moving. Moving forward, uh, we have a very busy agenda tomorrow, I believe. And um, again, I think it's just uh, an opportunity for us to uh, um, to uh, take this motion and bring it to the floor for debate. Okay. okay. Can I just follow up with a yeah, point yes. of clarification? Uh, sure. uh, another question on that, which is just to clarify: if, Have you spoken to the speaker who said, "Don't worry about about it. Go ahead." Or I just want to make sure when we yeah. do this, we have some clarity about what's the sort yeah. of precedent of when we skip past I have not I have not been in touch with the speaker okay yeah. thanks um I'll leave it there for now okay and just um uh just to build off that uh, if I can um does everyone have a list of who the speaker is so we're all playing with the same deck here okay uh thank you very much uh Councillor Boyle uh Councillor Meisner you can actually take me off the queue thanks Mayor thank you uh Councillor Klassen uh, no that's it thank you that's it okay, okay. Um, so we are voting on the motion, or sorry, we're, we've had the conversation, um, Councillor Klassen, um, uh, proposed a motion to skip the speaker 
and have a conversation and questions on um, on uh, uh, motion B2. And so I would need a seconder um, to ha make that happen. Okay, uh, Councillor Bly seconded that motion. Uh, all in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed say nay. Okay, so the motion passes. Now we are going to go into questions in the main queue on um, motion B2. Are there any uh, questions by any of the councillors? Okay, uh, there are none. So then, sorry, and bear with me here. This is definitely not on the script. Thank you very much, Councillor Klassen, for exercising new muscles here. Um, so, uh, okay. okay. So, the, so uh, there's no debate. Uh, we can go to the voting panel now. Uh, oh, sorry. Uh, just caught it in time. Uh, Councillor uh, Joe. Okay, I'm not sure. Do we need to do a closing remark? That's a process issue. I'm not sure. <laughs> yes, we do. Thank you for uh, highlighting that. Um, would you like to... Um, does okay, have any, uh, sure. I'll do one because I've prepared something already. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, please go ahead. Over. Okay. Thank you, Mayor. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, I want to thank, start by thanking uh, the discussion for my colleagues, uh, although we don't have a discussion. <laughs> and thanks for my councillors, my the uh, the mayor office and city city staff. Thanks. Uh, you all provided very good feedback for this motion. So I think through the lens of uh, equity, all people are people. They are not cogs on the machine. Equity work engage both hearts and minds, and requires us to relate to each other as a human being first. It is about embracing difference so that there's no room, there's a room for people to participate and contribute, not despite, but because of our diversity. City of Vancouver is probably the most diverse city on this planet, whether it is uh, ethnicities, uh, languages, uh, political beliefs, religions, cultures, or sexual orientations, etc. So we should acknowledge, respect, uh, appreciate and celebrate our differences and continue to build a city that is safe, accessible, inclusive, where people can live, work, and play. So let's face it, I think City of Vancouver made mistakes in the past. It has negatively affect some of other groups of people, whether it is indigenous community, Chinese community, or Italian community, or others. So in the 130 plus years history in Vancouver, out of the 10,000 bylaws, I'm not surprised to see some of the bylaws contradict to our existing equity framework, which was approached just two years ago, especially in the early days of, of the, this city. Well, I understand some of these discriminatory languages or practice were perhaps long before the, in the past, but it still harms and hurts people in that community. Uh, so I think we need to stand up for a true reconciliation. So also on a, on a different topic, I want to shout out to my fellow uh, councillor Kirby Young for her motion in 2020 to ask, ask staff to report back the, uh, for the discriminatory languages for our land title. So I think now it is time to also evaluate our bylaw, identify them and correct them. We are so fortunate to live in a democratic country uh, that we don't shy to acknowledge the mistakes we made before. We always learn from the mistake and reach out to the, to the, to the victims and also educate to ourselves to ensure this mistake will never ever happen again. This is because this is for us, for our children, grandchildren, and the generations after them. So if we conceal from the yesterday, escape from today, there will be no tomorrow. Uh, this is how we build a resilient community that is fair, safer, more equitable, more accessible, and more inclusive. So I'm really feeling very passionate about this motion. Uh, I really hope and urge my fellow councillor vote in supporting of this motion. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much, uh, Councillor Joe. Councillor Klassen. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Um, uh, just sort of, uh, just for, for people in the chamber, I'm, I, uh, I'm sorry that it, uh, this came uh, very quickly. It was not my intention to, uh, uh, to uh, sort of create any questions around this. It was truly a, a situation where I was looking at the, at the business we have at hand. Uh, I'll reach out to Mr. Pack himself and, and certainly would love to hear and thank him for the work that he's doing around uh, anti-Asian hate uh, advocacy. And um, I want to just uh, is, uh, express my support for uh, the uh, motion brought forward by Councillor Joe. 
Um, I had the uh, great pleasure of actually sitting down and meeting with our chief equity officer, Aftab, yesterday for the first time. And um, uh, I celebrate the work of her office uh, and of the city, and I'm very excited the fact that we're building upon that. Uh, last weekend, I was invited to speak to the BC, uh, the Vancouver Youth, Youth Parliament at UBC, um, which uh, was the truest expression I've seen of young people uh, from our uh, very diverse communities, all very much engaged in uh, exercising and learning about our parliamentary system of government. Uh, I was so excited to be there uh, and uh, posted uh, just a photo of the room um, uh, to, to uh, social media and uh, re received a, a sort of a racist comment in response to it. So it was a, a very quick reminder to me of what is still very present in our community is, uh, is uh, that level of uh, intolerance and, uh, and we have to do everything that we can do to make sure that we are supporting uh, our rich and diverse culture uh, here in the city. So I will be uh, most definitely supporting uh, Councillor Joe's motion. Thank you. Great. Thank you for, for <clears throat> excuse me. Thank you very much. Okay. Seeing no other questions, uh, I would like to put the uh, motion to a vote. Everyone can go to the voting panel. Great, and the motion passes unanimously. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, motion B3 is repealing Vancouver's single-use beverage cup fee and is to be moved and introduced by Councillor Bly. Councillor Bly, you have two minutes to introduce your motion. Thanks very much, Mayor. I won't probably take the two minutes. So uh, today I'm tabling a motion to repeal the um, 25 cent uh, single-use cup fee. And uh, the motion's asking staff to work with members of the business community to ensure that the fee can be removed in a manner that's both effective and efficient. Um, it's not a secret that this fee has been very unpopular, um, to say the least. Affordability is on everyone's mind. Um, this is just one small way that we can help ease that burden. But more importantly, what we've been hearing from businesses is that the cup fee is not... Uh, resulting in any change, really, uh, material change in consumer behavior. And so the hope is that with doing this, we can then focus on uh, waste reduction initiatives that actually work. Um, there are a number of examples. Um, there are existing programs that are underway, all of which can be supported, enhanced, um, and and um, put to good use um, without, a, without a sort of punitive uh, tax on single-use cups. Um, and I, I'd say that at the end of the day, there has been a number of scenarios that have been presented to us over time that show, that demonstrate that consumers do not have any other option other than to use a single-use cup. And in that case, this truly is a stick, not a carrot. So let's inspire, educate uh, the consumer and support businesses in making sure that we can change behavior to reduce um, single-use waste, which is incredibly important, um, and, and there are other ways we can achieve that. So hoping to get the support of Council to repeal this so we can focus on better policy. Great. Thank you very much. And I know there are questions here, so just as a reminder, uh, councillors, you have up to one minute to ask questions. Um, Councillor Boyle, you're up. Thanks. Uh, whereas 12 um, of the motion says overwhelmingly clear unambiguous evidence what is that evidence where I, I haven't seen evidence the staff haven't been able to compile information yet so and that's pretty strong language can you share where that evidence comes from and share it with us and the public the one example would be that um this bylaw applies to many, many, many thousands of businesses in the city of Vancouver. So far, um, those that are engaging in cup share programs is just over 100. So that would be uh, sort of a fraction of the businesses that have actually been impacted. Um, and I'd say the other evidence is the lack of um, alternate options um, for people to bring their own 
cups. So technology, businesses have just not advanced in the way that I think maybe we all had hoped when this was first brought forward and the way that it was sort of positioned by staff. But um, those initial numbers of um, any sort of share program, which is pretty vague in detail to start with, uh, applied to many thousands of businesses. Uh, it just is demonstrates that we don't have a groundswell of movement on this. In limited time. I, I'm sorry. I, debate that later. Yeah. I, I, I wasn't, we're way over. I apologize. Um, uh, Councillor Fry. Sorry, on that clear evidence on the 100 businesses, where, where's that figure from? I, I think it's just over 120. There was preliminary data that came out from staff in a memo a couple of weeks ago that I can pull up and happy to share that with you. Sure, I'd, I'd, yeah, and I could look for that as well. Uh, so why, uh, why, why the June 1st deadline? We've heard that staff needs some more time to... Oh, actually, it would be sooner if um, we could have staff sort of um, expedite the bylaw change and get it back to council, but by June 1st would be the soonest that that could be done. Any particular reason why June 1st? Uh, as opposed to May 1st or April 1st? I don't know, asking staff when, when reasonably... They could complete their work and get the report. Yeah, the, the staff feedback said that they could actually reasonably complete the bylaw change and get that back to council before well, June. Why June 1st? Well, they can't do it sooner. No, no, I'm just saying, why so soon? Why not? They, oh, because... The scheduled report back was September, so... Well, that is... Sorry, we're at time, time there. Um, sorry about that. Uh, Councillor Carr. Yes, just continuing on that. Well, um, I, I, I am questioning why you didn't wait till after we received the report back from staff due in September, um, which would then have provided us evidence upon which to make a decision. Um, well, there's two things. I think there is um, value in getting that evidence and that report back, which we could still very much do. But there's also um, the, um, the, the advocacy testimony from um, associations, from businesses themselves to say this is causing more challenges than it is benefit. And this has been um, incredibly unpopular since the day of its inception. And there hasn't, so, there hasn't been any less negative feedback around this tax. Even people who consider themselves uh, climate activists, climate um, pro-climate policy still say this is a really bad policy that needs to be changed. Have you discussed um, this with the businesses, the small businesses who have been putting into place programs, investing? Absolutely, and we will get representation from um, uh, many of those associations. Sorry, Councillor, you're at time. Membership. So yeah. associations Sorry. tomorrow. Sorry. Yeah. We're at time. Thank you very much. Um, seeing no other um, questions, uh, would someone like to second the motion? Great. Uh, Councillor Kirby Young. Now, we have received requests to speak to this. Uh, I'm not surprised. Uh, if Council would like to hear the speakers, we can refer the motion to tomorrow's Standing Committee on Policy and Strategic Priorities meeting on Wednesday, February the 15th, 2023, which starts at 9.30 a.m. Would someone like to move referral? Great. Thank you, uh, Councillor Dominato. Is there a seconder? Great. Uh, Councillor Montague. Thank you. All those in favour say yay. All those opposed say nay. Great. The motion is, is referred to tomorrow's standing committee meeting. Motion B4 is climate action costs and benefits and is to be introduced and moved by Councillor Carr. Councillor Carr, you have two minutes to introduce your motion. Emergency is real. It's accelerating. It has incredible damaging, damaging effects to our city and to the people of our city, including the loss of lives um, and incredible crossing infrastructure repair, um, as well as just having to mitigate the actual uh, GHG reductions causing, uh, causing the climate change. Um, we have had some very clear goals as a council around uh, what actions we want to take in our climate emergency action plan. Those goals, however, are very big big picture goals um, with objectives that are in the future. Our 2030 objectives being a 50% reduction in GHGs, our 2050 objective being net zero um, in terms of GHGs. Um, but to get there, we need very focused action. Um, that action is outlined in our climate emergency action plan around zero emission buildings, active transportation, uh, land use like walkable neighborhoods, low carbon construction, restored ecosystems. 
However, we are missing our goals. We are not getting to the reductions that we need to and we have said that we are aiming to. And in part, one has to question then, what is it we need to enable us to get there? In my mind, in any, in any business, in any nonprofit society, in any operation, one has to have a clear plan um, with actual real measurable act activities, a report on those activities uh, in a timely way so that you can adjust those activities if they're not meeting your goal. That is what my motion is about. Saving a carbon budget, making sure that we get the, um, the actual line by line items with associated uh, reductions in GHG, so emission reductions that will help us get to our target, and um, annual reports on how close we are getting, how effective those actions have been, um, the impacts, uh, both, uh, uh, both um, immediate as well as long-term in terms of actions that may reduce other costs in the future and impacts in the future, and, uh, and um, enabling course corrections so that we can meet those obligations. Sure. And, and you're at time. Sorry, a little over time. I apologize. Um, okay, uh, Councillor Montague. Uh, yeah, just a quick question. Has there been any thought with this motion regarding uh, possibly inviting the Auditor General in to weigh impacts, costs versus benefits as well? Okay. Besides them himself as to what programs he undertakes. Suggestions are just suggestions. He has his own work program. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Dominato. Uh, thanks, Mayor. Thanks, Councillor Carr. Um, just, I'm curious if you've given some further thought to um, regulatory changes that would address the issues, which I know you're quite passionate about. Um, you've talked a lot about budget gap, but I'm curious about the regulatory measures that might be needed to address the concerns. I think absolutely that's part of the uh, the program to achieve the reductions. Um, so if we have, I think, more detailed um, uh, measures outlined for us, um, the expectations around how the GHGs will be reduced, regulatory measures to implement them, um, and not just necessarily spending, but regulatory measures, measures are incredibly effective. But we could do that within the context of looking at costs and benefits and impacts and outcomes. Okay, thank you. That's my time. Great, thank you very much. Okay, uh, seeing no other, uh, no other questions, would someone like to second the motion? Councillor Boyle, thank you very much. Now, we've received requests to speak to this motion. If Council would like to hear the speakers, we can refer the motion to tomorrow's Standing Committee on Policy and Strategic Priorities meeting on Wednesday, February the 15th, 2023, which starts at 9.30 a.m. Would someone like to move referral? Okay, thank you, Councillor Dominato, seconded by Councillor Joe. Thank you. All those in favor say yay. Yay. All those opposed say nay. Great. The motion is referred to tomorrow's standing committee meeting. Okay. Uh, so notices of council member motions. And this is where we're going to slow down because last time <laughs> we kind of skipped through a couple of things. Um, are there uh, notices of council member motions for upcoming council meetings? No? Nope. Yes, Mayor, there are. <laughs> Oh. <laughs> Have uh, I'm still during the probation period, let me tell okay. you. Okay, Councillor Meisner, thank you. Yeah, so um, proposing a motion uh, for the next council meeting. Uh, title is Flag Raising at City Hall to Recognize Black History Month in Vancouver in 2024. Okay, great. Uh, great, and you did that. And I, I just as a reminder, so you, you this is for other people if they have anything else. Uh, reminder to please state the title of the motion and the date of the council meeting on which you intend to move the motion, and be sure to send the title via email to the city clerk. So we're all good. Awesome. Thank you. Um, seeing no one else in the queue. Last call. We're good. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, new business. We have one item uh, of new business on the agenda today, which are requests for leaves of absence as follows. Councillor, did I miss something? Okay. A little gun shy. You're looking at me a little uh, uh, 
Anyways, uh, Councillor F uh, Fry for Civic Business for meetings on February the 23rd, 2023 from 9.30 a.m. to 10 p.m. And Councillor Dominato for personal reasons for meetings on February the 23rd, 20, um, 2023 from 5 p.m. to 10 p.m. Would someone like to move the... And mine? Oh, I was going to put that later. Thank you. Sorry. And uh, there's a few uh, for me. On February the 14th, uh, uh, from 7 p.m. to 9 p.m. Uh, for civic business. Pardon? 10 p.m. Yeah, thank you very much. On March the 28th, from 5 p.m. Uh, to 10 p.m. for civic business. On March the 29th, uh, from 6 p.m. onwards for personal uh, reasons. On April the 26th, from uh, 4 p.m. onwards for civic business. And on uh, May 20 or May 11th, uh, 2023, from noon onwards for personal uh, reasons. Would someone like to move uh, the motion? Great. Um, sorry, you, uh, was that con Councillor Dominato? Is there a seconder? Say Councillor Kirby Young. All those in favor say yay. Yay. All those opposed say nay. Great. The motion carries unanimously. Uh, Council, are there any other items of new business? Um, Council, are there any inquiries or other matters? Okay, uh, may we have a motion? Oh, sorry. Right. Councillor Dominato. Uh, thanks, Mary. Yeah, uh, a couple of inquiries and just and sharing of information. Uh, one is just to highlight, and I did share this with Mayor and Council, is that the Tashmi Historical Society has reached out to us, in particular, uh, the Mayor of um, uh, District of Hope with respect to the historic Hope Station and they are um, participating in a national uh, contest, national trust, um, specifically focused on heritage sites and the reason I bring it up is that they have reached out to us um, um, asking us to support them. We can vote each day uh, up till February 22nd in support of the uh, historic Hope Station. And the reason it is important to the Tashmi community and to uh, Japanese Canadians is that I think roughly 8,000 Japanese Canadians went through that station uh, to the Tashmi internment camp. Um, and uh, many of those individuals were displaced from Vancouver. And so um, just sharing that um, they are hopeful of winning $50,000 towards the restoration of, of that station. It was at risk of being demolished. And then the Tashmi Historical Society intervened and now they are participating in this national uh, campaign contest. And so um, anyone can vote, and you can vote once a day, uh, and uh, they would love our support. Um, they're one of two BC projects that are narrowed down to 10, uh, 10 participants. So uh, sharing that. Um, I have a couple of others that um, I just wanted to share. As one is, uh, again, thanks and gratitude to the federal government for their support uh, yesterday to Chinatown and the revitalization of Chinatown. I think most of us were there, and it was really uh, wonderful to see that support. And uh, so, again, just reiterating that. Um, thirdly, uh, on the subject uh, of um, just sharing the ongoing concerns of uh, businesses along the Broadway corridor. Um, well, we all welcome the Broadway line expansion to Arbutus and hopefully out to UBC in the future. Uh, there continues to be concerns from the businesses and merchants along that area. And, um, and I know that we will be receiving a report back from staff in the next month or two around uh, potential opportunities for relief. But I, I think we also need to renew a call um, to the province as well in, in advocating for those businesses and support for them. Um, so again, just a reflection there. And then um, lastly, because I don't think we'll have an opportunity to um, speak to this directly. I think, Mary, you may have comments tomorrow, but around um, Pink Shirt Day is that next Wednesday is Pink Shirt Day. And um, as a council, we've always worn pink shirts. I think we'll be doing that tomorrow. But I, I think it's some really important, and especially on the heels of the motion that uh, Councillor Joe brought um, 
uh, a reminder about the importance of addressing bullying, discrimination, violence uh, in our schools. It started in the schools uh, in Nova Scotia. It was, um, I'm honored to call Travis Price a friend and he was one of the young people who started this movement. Um, but also uh, in our workplaces, in our communities, and we heard um, our, our Park Board Commissioners talking about this, uh, Brendan, last night about in sport, but also in politics. And so um, I look forward to us doing, uh, I think, a photo tomorrow, but I just wanted to reflect that. I think it's a really important um, opportunity to uh, challenge what's going on in some of our communities and our workplaces and our schools. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much, Councillor Dominato. Uh, Councillor Claussen. Thank you, Mayor. Just uh, a couple of quick items. First of all, I just want to wish uh, uh, everybody here and, uh, and the uh, rest of the people who work for the City of Vancouver a happy Valentine's Day. Um, I also want to uh, present uh, just a little bit of an update. There was a question from Councillor Boyle uh, uh, recently uh, uh, with regard to the Folk Fest. Uh, I just have some uh, a very, very brief update. I spoke again. I was contacted today by a representative of the Folk Fest board. Um, and uh, the, that I can say is that they are still actively looking at options to continue the festival in some form. It may be very small. Uh, it may be as small as <clears throat> one day. It may be at a different venue or different location. Uh, but it certainly sounds like the, the organizers there are turning over every stone to try and make uh, this marquee cultural event uh, continue despite the challenges that we're hearing uh, ar around uh, the community about events like this in general, the, the costs of uh, the utilities that they use, the cost of security, the cost of fencing. Uh, everything has gone up through COVID and un unfortunately it's making it harder and harder for these, uh, these joyous occasions to happen. Uh, but they are certainly uh, feeling um, support from, uh, from here, the people here at, in the city council chamber and uh, and across the community. So I remain uh, ever hopeful that um, uh, that the Folk Festival will be able to continue and other festivals like it uh, will continue to carry on and thrive in the uh, years ahead. Thanks very much. Great. Thank you very much, Councillor Claussen. Councillor Boyle. Uh, thanks. And I too have been in regular touch with the Folk Festival uh, folks, so appreciate that update. Uh, publicly, um, m my question is around. Um, are we on inquiries? Yeah, we're inquiries and other matters. Just trying to read your the facial expressions, I saw to make sure I'm in the right place. Uh, uh, Council's been receiving a number of emails about uh, lease renewals of temporary modular housing sites, L Larwell, and then other upcoming lease renewals. I know a question's been submitted, but I wonder wondered if staff had a, a response for now or if we could get more detail back to be able to reassure those members of the public we're hearing from that we're, uh, that we're working on it. So thanks, Councillor, for uh, the question. So yeah, the, the, um, the license agreements that are expiring this year are, is Laurel Park. Um, and right now, the BC Housing is working with the operator there on finding alternate uh, housing for the folks at that site. And the city's involved with that as well. Um, the other license agreements, lease agreements, are not expiring imminently. Um, and certainly for city sites, we're looking at extending those. Um, so we can provide council with a more detailed kind of um, overview of when those other um, arrangements are due to expire and what we're doing with each of them. But yeah, the, the immediate um, work that's happening right now is around Laurel Park. I uh, appreciate that. And uh, as a follow-up question, um, wondering if the physical buildings at Larwell site, if we're looking at other sites around the city for relocating those, so we're not seeing a net loss of spaces. Um, yeah, that, that's a, uh, another good question and a challenging one. The, the work that BC has, Housing has done um, subsequent to the original installation of those temporary modular buildings, that that the, the temporary aspect of them is extremely expensive. So the, the, move, the disassembly and, and movement to another site for another short-term period of time, um, we've now discovered is not economically feasible. So um, this original TMH program where we're looking at five to 10 year windows, what we've heard from BC Housing is, is that that's not actually a workable model. Um, what we're looking for is more longer term sites. Um, so the permanent modular supportive housing program, of course, are, it's a different type of building, but that we're now focusing on that. Um, 
so that that's one kind of challenge I think that we're facing there. Um, we're always looking at opportunities for sites. We've got the new workforce modular that are coming on Main Street and Ash Street. Um, so still looking at those opportunities in terms of the specific plans for these two structures at Larwell, uh, those two buildings. I don't actually know the answer, but I can follow up on on that. Okay, but appreciate that. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much, uh, Councillor Carr. Yeah, thank you. I, um, that um, question and answer prompted me to just continue um, with a question there. The buildings are phenomenal. I've, I've toured them right from the beginning. The housing is, in, you know, superb housing uh, that meets the needs. So uh, when you say that you are you're just at the very end that you're looking at potential um, uh, permanent sites, uh, I am I'm interested in asking, would those be city lands or private lands or, um, you know, what... Are, are the whole gamut, um, and yeah, so that's my So, point. yeah, thanks, Councillor. So, so our team is um, looking at sites for supportive housing. As you know, we've got the permanent supportive housing modular, um, modular housing uh, initiative that we're working on with BC Housing, the 300 units that we had committed to. The focus right now is for that. Um, generally, the sites that we have in Vancouver um, generally will accommodate more density than, than those buildings. Like th those buildings are, are generally too low density to make good use of city land. We would be looking for much more, many more units, um, or more dense um, kind of structures. So I, I, I don't want to preclude that mm. that would ever be the case. Um, so yeah, our, the, the, our, the team um, in, a, in a market housing is looking at sites generally. Our focus right now is on those 300 units and making sure that we can deliver on that MOU with BC Housing. Um, again, w with respect to BC Housing's plans, because they own these two buildings, what their plans are for these units, I, I don't know, but I can I can follow up. And are they movable over longer distances? My, my, you answered are, yeah. the question right away, which was I wanted to confirm if they are BC Housing. They okay. are, yeah. And we, they could be moved. They, they can be. They're designed to be moved. Yeah. What we found, though, is, is moving them repeatedly is very expensive. Got it. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Appreciate that. That's it. Great. Uh, thank you uh, very much. I'm going to... How do I get on the queue here? Thank you very much. Uh, so I asked the court, I, do I have to see the chair when I ask a question or no, we're good? I, just a point of procedures so I know for next time because this is a, you know, a new sensation for me. When we go through inquiries and other matters, do we have that level of detail of questions? Is that the form for this or do we have it somewhere else? I, I just want to know because I, I, I don't know. Is this normal? Okay, that's yes. all I need to know. Thank you it's, very much. You council can ask whatever you want. Okay, awesome. I, I, I just, I can answer I just it on didn't the fly, know but, yeah. what, what the expectation yeah. was here, so um, but I, I didn't want to cut it off. Uh, so thank you very much for that clarification. Okay, um, on that note, uh, may we have, seeing no one else in the queue here, may we have a motion to adjourn? Uh, Councillor Klassen uh, seconded. Councillor Bly, all in favor, say yay. yay. All opposed, say nay. This meeting is adjourned. Thank you very much.